Okay, so welcome to QC Bios Every Workshop 29, Demultiplexing Planning and Execution, Advice and Best Practices from Experience for uh, the uh, winter quarter 2023. This is the second iteration of this workshop. And you should all have the slides and email uh, from last night, and uh, you may have, find it helpful to follow along on, on your own screen. So I thought I thought I'd start with just kind of maybe going through some of the goals that I have for for uh, what we're doing here. And there's there's many levels at which you could uh, come to the material that I that I have here. You could at, at sort of the 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 easiest level. There's just some things that you should follow before you do sequencing that help you avoid problems that I've encountered. And so that's sort of the easiest level. It's just uh, at the end here, we'll have a slide that just sort of summarizes some uh, things to do and things to avoid. And uh, the best way to handle problems is to just not have them come up in the first place. A lot of the complexity here derives from a little easier is detecting the problem, but even, even that has some challenges. And then remediating the problems uh, after they happen is a lot harder. And so, yeah, so then, then there's various levels when you get into this detection and remediation stage, there's various levels at which you come to that too. And so, you know, don't feel like you have to like, you know, do everything that we're gonna say or whatever. You take away from this, whatever level you're comfortable with and makes sense for your situation and so on. So, you know, basically the thing here is that I think a lot of people operate in a mode where they think Emux is just this trivial thing. There's not really anything to say there. It's mostly something that even happens out of sight, out of mind, because you kind of send your sample sheet off to the, to the core. You get files back that are already deboxed. What's there to even, I mean, like, do you even have any ability to put a handle on this process, right? It just kind of happens in the black box outside of the control. All that's basically false. There's a lot going on in DMUX. It doesn't always work great. Um, when, when I say, like, often in this entire workshop, I'm going to mean things that are maybe at like the five. Five ten percent of lane level, something like that that would be what I would consider often. Even, um, you know, the majority of runs do do okay, but you know, we run thousands of runs on campus uh, a year, uh, and you know, over you know, even like one percent of runs is still a lot of runs. And if you're the person on who's you know, generally one run these days is many projects because of the extent of which the number of lanes on a flow cell and the number of projects sharing a lane. So even you know, even as you know, a hundred runs or you know, fifty runs is a lot of projects that are impacted. And so, um, yeah. So so you know, develop some appreciation awareness of these situations. Um, like I say, you know, you know, a middle level would be sort of like uh, being able to like find you know detect these in your own runs, uh, and then a harder level is to sort of like uh, actually remediate uh, things. Um, the usual approach that people do, which is this sort of this blind faith black box approach where you just sort of think you know what's in your mix, you, you compose a sample sheet, send it off, files come back. This is sort of an automated, uh, the core isn't really doing much more than just sort of combining your sample sheet with the other guys on the lane and putting it on the instrument and letting base space uh, do it typically, or BCL to fast too, sometimes if you want to do it not in the cloud. And that, that approach just doesn't always uh, work well. Um, and the way that I know that is that my personal history has resulted in me actually demultiplexing 600 some lanes from the BSCRC core without any of the assumptions that are normally made in this process. And by doing that, I discovered many, many things, which I'm going to talk about in here. And uh, it is through that experience uh, that you realize this, this is true, that the standard approach has, has faults. Um, another goal here is so that you could actually be able to run the Illumina conversion tools yourself so that you could actually take a raw run folder, which all cores will generally give to you if you want. It may not be their default delivery mechanism, but all the cores will give you the raw data if you, if you ask for it. Um, and you can get that off base space usually anyway, because the first thing that gets uploaded from the core side of base space is the raw run folder. Typically uh, during the actual run on the instrument, the instrument uploads the raw run folder to base space. Since the base space has that data and you can suck it back down. So you do have access uh, to it generally. And uh, we'll go through how you would run like Illumina's tools uh, yourself um, so that you can have the ability to convert raw run folders uh, to uh, the data. 
Um, you can also do some of it, uh, you know, in base space, but it does allow you to upload new sample sheets and re-run uh, uh, new sample sheets demuxing online. But the, you don't really get full parameter control uh, that way. Um, but that's, you know, that's another option too, if you don't really uh, have the, the resources or, or the don't, for other reasons, don't want to run a piece of the to yourself. So as a, as a consequence of doing those 600 runs for BSCRC, um, uh, I ended up kind of creating my own method for DMUX that's uh, much more data driven. You let the data tell you what's in the lane and you build a sample sheet after you let the data tell you. And so um, this is a much more sort of rational approach and sort of a, it kind of brings DMUX into a kind of a quality control framework at that point. And uh, this can detect and mitigate the, essentially the, the, the problems that the blind approach has. And it's often, you know, when I say often again, we're talking about the lanes that are in practice. So it's, you know, the five, 10% of lanes that have some kind of. And then issues, of course, have all kinds of orders of magnitude in terms of how much they're impacted. Some lanes are impacted, but kind of in a minor way. Other lanes are kind of more moderate. Some lanes are severely impacted. And even those severe cases, this uh, approach I have can often basically completely recover them. And so with that, there's no need for new sequencing and so on. It's just sort of deficiencies of the blind approach that just don't let it realize what's actually going on. And the data is actually fine. Um, and even for lanes that are not impacted, uh, this approach, besides giving you sort of a QC assurance, it says you've actually looked instead of, instead of just believing, you've actually looked and now have positive data that supports that the lane actually uh, went well on the, on the sample level. Most lanes have some modest recovery improvement with this approach, meaning that the number of reads that you can put into each sample file goes up a little. And so why not, you know, you know, that's that's sort of free more data. Most people would rather have uh, deeper coverings than not. Um, and so, yeah, I, I sort of don't expect, you know, most people to just kind of do this whole, the full blown approach all themselves. But as I was talking about earlier, you don't really need to, it's not an all or nothing approach. You can kind of come into this in degrees. Um, yeah, so the overall goal is to basically help you conduct better and more successful sequence driven science. Right? I, I already know how to do this. My whole point in this workshop is to sort of tell you guys uh, more uh, and share share this knowledge that I gained from this uh, thousands and thousands of hours that I spent uh, doing this. Um, so yeah, so the context, of course, is DNA sequencing, and, and and for what you know, sort of the the main mental model here is basically you know you have a tube which has got DNA fragments in it. It goes into this magic box, and out comes. ACGT strings. Uh, that's basically the, the sort of the mental picture we got going here. These are the Illumina sequences that the sequences the BSCRC core has uh, been running since we actually a little bit before BSCRC. We had some of the Nelson and Jackson labs uh, early on in campus 2007. We started with the GA1, which is a Selexa machine, Illumina box Selexa. So we named them all Illumina, but originally the company was called Selexa. Uh, we had a GA1 as our first machine. We had J2, 2X, high C2000, 2500, 4000, Nova 6, 6000 is our current version. And Primus is about to get a Nova 6X. Um, that's, that's kind of cool. um, we got a Nova 6000 in 2017, so actually, we're pretty good to run on that. Um, if you've gotten runs from BSCRC, you may know, you know, you get these issue track numbers, but there's also a run name that comes from like GAP018. Lane three, yeah, L3 for lane three or something like that. You know, these are the kind of names that the BSCRC core identifies lanes with, uh, and they decode in the following way. The first letter is actually the machine. So anything that's on the CD is our Nova 66000. Um, the DE tells you that it was an S1 flow cell. There's different kinds of flow cells for different capacities on this machine. Uh, and it, the D tells you it was run on the B side of the machine because the Nova 66000 has a, two, a dual flow cell capacity. And the uh, P tells you it was a paradigm run. And the 160 is the, it means it's the 160th run in the ZDP uh, kind of series. And L2 means lane two. Um, and so the, you know, what you see here is, is kind of just how much the throughput and speed has kind of increased over the years. It's, it's exponential growth, uh, even faster than more volume you know, working for kind of the, the computer hardware. Um, yeah. Um, 
I think we infected JCCC a little bit with it. I'm not sure if they name all their runs that way. They used to run some of their run some of their names. They, they have like the C, D, and E machines and the F machine. The C was for cancer sensor. We started them at the other end of the alphabet. You know, we kind of started around the N for Nelson, S for Steve, and then kind of went down towards the bottom. Um, but yeah, some some yeah, you know, different cores have different what they consider the primary identifier of, of a of a run. For for BSCRC, this is our primary identifier for a lane. Um, so here are the different uh, NovaSeq flow cell types. Uh, there's four four of them basically: S prime or SP, S1, S2, and S4 in order of increasing throughput. Uh, they all have two lanes on them. The lane is essentially the unit that you can load with a fluidic sample. So you may have multiple labs or groups of people sharing a lane, but at some point, all the liquid from those guys had to get mixed into one tube. And that one tube is what get loaded onto the lane. Each lane can be loaded with an independent uh, sample. Um, two lanes and everything except S4s so have four lanes. And then the physical surface of the flow cell, the flow cells are essentially just glass boxes with holes on the end so that you can put a tube, you know, a pipe carrying liquid on one end and a pipe carrying liquid on the other end. And then if I suction on this end and suck liquids through the channel. The reason you want to do suction and not push is because when there's leaks, suction just doesn't do anything. If you, if you push and there's leaks, then the fluid goes everywhere. Um, so yeah, so I mean, this is what the inside of flow cell works. And the inside of this thing is basically coated with, you know, some kind of gel and oligos and all kinds of stuff there. Um, uh, yeah, so roughly the throughput is kind of 1x, 2x, 4.5, and, and 6x. And our flow cell distribution that we run on BSRC in 22. Pretty much, it's very heavy. The S prime and S fours, uh, very little uh, S twos and the S ones have kind of become uh, pretty unpopular too these days. The reason is, as you'll see in a second, is because basically the cost per base on the S four is where you want to be. So everyone gets pushed uh, pushed that way. And I brought I brought an S four flow cell for you to look at. This is a dead one. You know, I mean, these things are ten thousand dollars or whatever. When they when they're used, but once they're used, they're done. Um, if you take it out, uh, I recommend washing your hands. You should probably wash your hands anyway, so it's too much bag thing at this point. People don't to touch it, but you can pass it around and look at it. You'll actually see that the fraction is this is there's a nanostructure of nano little holes and nano wells on the glass of that thing. You'll actually see it if you bounce the light off, you can see it refracting to the rainbow colors from the from just the, the structure of it. Um, so you probably know that Sluxa Lumina is a sequencing by synthesis strategy. That's the chemistry is SBS. Originally, uh, they did this bridge application to grow up the little clusters or colonies or whatever you want to call them on the flow cell. These days, uh, we use pattern flow cells with, uh, with, net, with lithography etched uh, with pores in a, in a regular hexagonal grid. And so now we use something called XAMP application to grow the clusters, but it, it's kind of the same. It's just kind of where the clusters physically land on the flow cell. But as you know, you got to take your DNA fragments and gray there. You got to stick these adapters on them, which are other short pieces of DNA that just have particular sequences that interface with the platform. And we, we kind of put these on the flow cell and then we grow up little colonies, you know, essentially, you know, solid phase PCR, if you like, or whatever. Um, we grow up little, you know, maybe thousand member colonies uh, at each place there. And, uh, then the way the sequencing works is you you put a sequencing primer down, which you know binds to somewhere in the in the adapters, and then you start washing over these fluorescently labeled free nucleotides that have reversible terminators on, them, right? So you wash over a mix that's got ACGTs where there is those are four fluorophores that glow in different colors, but only one base incorporates because of the terminator. Then you take the laser, you image the whole thing, take a picture. And so the whole flow cell is glowing different colors. Each color tells you the first base of each spot, right? And then you reverse the reversible terminator, cleave off the fluorophore, and now you repeat the whole thing again. And now you get cycle two and the second base of every spot glows. And it's a synchronous cell, it's a synchronous system. You know, some of the other platforms these days are not synchronous. Um, they let each little colony do its own thing or some of them are single molecule or whatever, but uh, this is the Illumina uh, platform. The reason why you grow colonies is that gives you a macroscopically observable amount of light. Otherwise, you're talking about trying to observe, you know, a single fluorophore as far as this, instead of a collection of them. Uh, so that's you know that's the that's the process. The original chemistry was four colors. Each of the four fluorophores was a distinct uh, you know you know an nanometer wavelength of, of light. They are now only two colors and uh, red and green basically. 
and the uh, four the four bases are are like this, basically. Uh, T is green, uh, C is red, A is yellow, which is both red and green, and G is actually black. It's just dark, uh, no glow at all. Um, this is what the nano wells look like on the flow cell. Uh, you zoom in here; it's literally like little circular pits uh, done with, you know, kind of the thing we make uh, you know, computer chips with lithography. Uh, it's a hexagonal close-packed uh, lattice here. There's the cross section. Um, the wells are coated with oligos that interface with the adapters. And the way XAMP uh, works is that uh, you wash over a very low concentration of your library. And the idea is that single molecules of your guys will find their way randomly into a hole. But then the amplification reaction is so fast that the entire, all the available uh, little projections in that well will completely polymerize out the guy that landed before anybody else gets in there. That's the idea. So it's called exclusion amplification, I can't. Uh, because you know, we want basically each well to be exactly one molecule from you and not a mixture, whatever. And uh, this is also fairly robust to overloading because once the well is polymerized, it doesn't do anything. So if you kind of keep washing over or have a high concentration wash over, you shouldn't, you know, eventually this, there's just nothing for anything to react with and just washes out the other end. And so you tend to get a pretty good uh, fill rate on those wells, right? You want all the wells to be singly filled, ideally. You don't want any of the wells to be multiply filled. And, you know, wells that are not filled at all are just wasted. And the uh, histogram up there on the right is the distribution of PF1, as it's called. Uh, it stands for purity filter. Uh, it's a long history of that built in chastity filter a long time ago and so on. But the name doesn't really matter. That, that's basically the, the instrument software's decision as to whether the well is singly filled or not. And so that's the typical distribution we see, you know, maybe 65 to 90% is the common range. Uh, once in a while, we get a lane that's worse than that. But, you know, if you're out there in the 80s, 80, 90% range, that's the mean of the distribution. Uh, so, mm -hmm. Well, how, yeah, I mean, what matters is where are the sequencing primers that occurred during the actual sequencing bind in your prepared molecule. You know, there's a million ways to do libraries and so on. But at some point, either you gave us a primer that we loaded on the instrument or you're using the stock primers uh, from Luna. Those either bind somewhere in your prepared molecule or they don't. If they don't, you're going to get black, which basically is going to sequence as poly G. If they do bind, you're going to get as a sequence, whatever comes downstream of that sequence. Um, so how that relates to the strands of your original material and so on just depends completely on the library side. Um, okay. So the, the physical locations in the flow cell all have a coordinate system and are numbered. Uh, this is an eight lane high seek uh, 4K flow cell, all lanes one to eight. You'll see, you see the flow slide passed around. That only had that was an S4, it had four lanes, but they're much, they're pretty chunky and big and so on, whatever. But uh, yeah, each lane, you know, the lanes are numbered. And if you zoom into a lane, you know, they're very long and thin. Uh, the way the instrument works is it's basically got a microscope and the, and the flow cells are on an XY stage. And uh, there's a fixed camera system looking down the microscope that basically scans a horizontal line or whatever. And the stage just drags along, and that's how the camera system scans. That was called a SWAT. And if the width of the line you can image isn't enough to cover the whole flow cell width, then you got to do multiple SWATs. And in fact, actually, the system has a focus. It can do, you know, Z can be either kind of a high or a low. You actually can image the inside top surface or the inside the bottom surface of the flow cell as well. And so you get sort of the top and the bottom, and then however many SWATs in, in 4K, it was two SWATs. Uh, in uh, in S4 on, on Novus, you can actually six swaths, but basically, you know, they're kind of you, you scan these little strips uh, out uh, with your imaging system. And the top, and so uh, then the then the long axis is just arbitrarily broken into pieces that are more square because it's kind of inconvenient to deal with an image that's kind of really tall and narrow. And so you kind of subdivide them. And so sort of for high C 4K, these tiles end up being numbered like. The, the leading one means it's, it's like the top surface or whatever, and then two would be the, the bottom surface, and then 
the next digit is sort of the one for the yellow or two for the green swath. And then the 01 to 28 was just numbering them from top to bottom down this thing. And that's the, that's the so-called tile uh, coordinate system. For NovaSeq, the tile numbering depends on what uh, flow cell you have, because essentially the spots are all the same size. And so in the way you get more throughput is you just have more, more tiles. Uh, you just make a physically bigger uh, surface to image. Um, and so for S4s, it's actually uh, two surfaces, one, two, six swaths and 78 uh, tiles uh, down the long, long axis. The, within each tile, there's an XY coordinate system. And these are what you actually see in FASTQ files. You may not have realized it, but this is actually what, what some of those fields are. And there's X, Y coordinates, the pile X and Y coordinates. And you can read the slide of, you know, when you get time, but basically the hexagonal lattice is in here and, and the X and Y coordinates just go from these particular values. Everything works out perfectly. They're actually scaled. They might even be, I don't know if they're in, in nanometers or tens or hundreds of nanometers, whatever they are anyway. The, the sort of the, uh, the ratios here has a square root of three in it because that's what it, you know, it's got like an equilateral triangle in there or whatever, you know, it all works out. But anyway, it, it basically each tile ends up being 1776 by 2304, or about 4 million uh, wells. And then however many tiles you have in multiply on, that's how you get the, the tile, the wells for the flow cell or for the lane. So you've all seen FASTQ files, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure this is the output of uh, the machine. The uh, primary image analysis and base power, which is RTA, uh, it lives on a Linux machine internal to the physical device these days. And so basically you don't get fast few files out, you get these raw run folders out, which have binary files that have changed format a zillion times over the years. But essentially the data knows this is exactly what you're gonna see in, in a fast few file. Um, and so the conversion of the raw run folder to the fast few file is really just a format conversion and not like a, there's not really a lot of compute going on there. It's just a translation of, of presentation. The only action that typically occurs during FASTQ generation is optionally DMUX, uh, but that's not really related to the base calls. That's just putting reads in different piles, not like recomputing the reads. So uh, yeah, you know, FASTQ is a four line format uh, per read. Uh, line one, which has the names of something like that. Line two has the actual sequence of ACPPN. Line three is, for stupid reasons, is usually just a single plus sign these days. Uh, and line four is the per base quality scores that are in character sync with uh, line two. Um, the names here, here let, me, uh, let me just line up between these two slides. All I did is insert some uh, spaces to kind of line up visually some things that'll make it easier to kind of see uh, the, the structure here. The first column is actually the instrument serial number. That's a little unique, you know, a little, it's literally a barcode on the back of the machine. Then the second field is actually what's called the scan number which for the lifetime of the instrument just counts one, two, three, four, five as you do runs on the instrument. Um, the next uh, one is the flow cell serial number, which is actually the same as the barcode printed on the physical reagent. The next one is the lane number. Then there's the tile number. Then there's the X coordinate within the tile, the Y coordinate within the tile. So now you can, that's completely physical location of where this, this read came from. The next one is the end within the series. So if like if you're doing main ends, that'll be one for single end, one and two for paired ends. For indexing, it restarts from one. And so if it's single index, you'll see a one there. If you're looking at the dual index, second index, you'll see a two there. Uh, the next one is the PF status, but NovaSeq uh, does not even really give you the data for the empty, empty wells. There's not really any point anymore. And so this is always going to be an end in any file you ever see. Um, uh, this is an obsolete field. It used to relate to alignments to various control sequences that are long gone. Uh, it's always going to be zero these days. And this one has to do with DMUX. Now here I'm showing you a pre-DMUX uh, sequencing file. So it'll always be a zero. If you have a DMUX file, then what you should see here are the index reads, possibly a virtual index read, like if it was dual indexing and the two sequences have been put together which will actually see the nucleotides that we use to make the DMUX decision out of here. Uh, then of course, we have the actual discrete base calls for the reads, ACGTN uh, sequence, those are five prime and three prime in the order that the SBS chemistry produced them. As I said, that's just a historical artifact in line three. And then these days, uh, the NovaSeq only produces four quality scores ever. And uh, you know, there's this spread uh, uh, with an ASCII shift encoding for, for this stuff in the old, 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 days it wasn't even spread scale and then 
sometimes it was asking to shift 64, but very most commonly used these days for years now, 33 has been more common. But anyway, they, these days the quality scores aren't even continuous like they kind of used to be on the old machines. I and mean, the old machines used to get a lot of different answers. But these days they're bin uh, because essentially they're almost just kind of binary with the insert kind of things. Yeah, I don't know what's going on, or yeah, I'm pretty sure. So it's almost it's almost just a binary call, and not really so much gradation. Anyway, ends are always quality score zero, but fast few files, all of the luminous converged for fast few files absolutely refuse to admit a quality zero. They always bump up to minimum Q2. So although RTA calls them zero, any fast few file you generally see is going to call those a two. Ends will always have a quality two, which is 35 in ASCII, which is a hash mark. All the other guys are going to be either 11, 25, or 37, which is going to come out as a comma colon or F. And roughly those are where the, the base color thinks there's a one in 10, one in three, or one in 5,000 chance of being wrong. But kind of looks like these two are kind of like good bases and these are bad bases. It's really just kind of the way to think of it these days. Um, single file, single FASTQ files typically involve a single lane of a single run and represent reads from a specific primer or stage in the chemistry, like either first main end, second index, something like that. And that means that all of these columns are generally completely constant in one file. But, you know, whatever, it's a line oriented format, so we just repeat them over and over, but that's one reason why we keep them GZIP, because all that stuff can be compressed pretty easily. Um, within a lane of a single run, this is the physical location, right? Tile X, Y, that's basically the unique ID for, for the read. And uh, the PF and DMUX status are properties of the well. And so when you have the multiple files for a single read, like main, you know, first main end, second main end, first index, second index, those, these are well properties and the status for that read will be the same in all those files. So it won't vary across the files. We, we do give it over and over in each of the, you know, one, two, three, four files, but then it will be the same. And the order of the reads in a fast read file, it's best if you kind of, always just assume it's just not specified. But in practice, files that are close to the instrument, like out of all, all of the luminous tools and so on, their initial conversion, they're going to be physically ordered. They're going to be in increasing tile order major and then breaking ties by ascending Y coordinate and then breaking ties by ascending X coordinate. And so they're completely physically ordered on the flow cell. And that means that the edges of the file are edge tiles on the flow cell and they're weird. So never, 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 never. People do this all the time. It says, oh, I looked at the top of the file and the sequencing is so bad or whatever. No, no. The top of the file is completely unrepresentative of the, of the main thing. You've got, to, you've got to look at the whole thing. Take statistics over the whole thing, a random sample of the whole thing. You cannot use this edges of files as sort of like anything to make a decision about. Um, right, okay. So we've been talking kind of about the bottom half. Now let's talk a little bit about the uh, top half. Um, so, you know, whatever library approach you're doing, it depends on what you're doing, you know, RNAC, CHIPC, BSC, CHI-C, whatever, you know, uh, you know, million, million of applications these days. You're, no matter what library prep protocol you had, you're gonna end up with a, a pile of a zillion things that look like this, right? Adapter, some kind of fragment of interest and adapter. And these, these fragments typically you cannot arrange for them to have exact lengths. So right, you know, they're like low hundreds of bases for your for your user DNA, unless you're doing short, you know, at SRNA or you know, whatever. But you know, typically that's going to be low hundreds of nucleotides for the blue part, and there's going to be a little wiggle in the length there. Um, and you know, Avogadro's number is huge, right? So it doesn't take much before you got, you know, just huge numbers of these things, even in a tube at low concentration. And uh, at, you know the purple parts, the adapters, they're short, like dozens of base pairs, right? And they've got three main functions, right? First, they have to interface your your blue part to the actual platform, right? So they got to interface you to the flow cell and exit. Uh, they control what parts get sequenced when in the entire sequencing process through the sequencing primers, right? And they also serve to identify the material, the original materials when you mix multiple samples in the lane because we can embed unique sequences in there so that if a certain sample gets prepped with a particular set of adapters that in the variable part of the adapter has a sequence that we can control and make sure is uniform for one of our samples, then if we sequence that variable part during the actual sequencing, we can use that to tease out again, which sample is which, because the sequencer doesn't have any idea. Sequencer just takes, sequencer just makes ACGT strings, right? Just primes and ACGT strings. That's all the sequencer does. Has no idea 
where any of this stuff comes from and does not care. Uh, so that's the DEMA. This is basically what goes in the information for DEMA. So that's done after sequencing is done. Right. So basically, this is this is the physical order that things happen in. Uh, one, two, three, four. Now some of these are optional. You know, two, three, and four are optional basically, but they're always in that order. Uh, so first you do the first main end, you prime, you know, right here. So you basically the end of the primer is right at the beginning of the blue part. And you do your 51 or 101 base reads or whatever. You get your first main read, the, the single, the single read. If, uh, we'll use that term. Uh, then uh, then you can do the typically we don't run indexless lanes anymore. That that's that's been gone for a few years. So this isn't really optional. Everybody runs step two. And that's where you prime somewhere inside the adapter and then do a short read, maybe eight or 10 nucleotides or something. And that's where you interrogate this variable portion that you're going to use to identify the original material with. Then there's also this, you know, the, the idea these days, uh, uh, and we'll talk about uh, later on day three, I think, uh, dual index, well, a little bit of day two, and then more on day three, uh, we get to also index hopping. Um, but dual indexing, where you have a second place. In the adapter, I mean, it could really be in the, in the first. Yeah, I mean, and don't take this picture too literally, right? The actual positions and orientations of these things can vary, but uh, you know, there's some other place in one of the other adapters where you can prime again and get another short, and so that's this dual idea of dual indexing. And then uh, almost all runs these days are also paired end, where we actually prime at the opposite end of the blue part and grab another 50 or 100 basis for this end. And of course, if your blue part is very short, uh, these uh, two main ends, one and four, can overlap, and then you're wasting sequencing effort. If uh, the blue part is really, really short and your uh, main reads are longer than the blue part, you'll actually read into the adapter. So, um, but that all, how you handle that all just depends upon your downstream processing and so on. The sequencer does not care. Sequencer just primes and goes. And wherever you end up, you end up. And if you end up running off the end of an adapter, it's going to go black, and then you're just going to get poly Gs out of the base color. Um, that didn't used to be true on earlier machines because black used to be not a base in the four-color chemistry, but in two-color chemistry machines, uh, black comes out as poly G. So how many cycles typical do we see for these various stages? Well, here you see kind of the unique numbers that we kind of see commonly. Um, now, because there are multiple lanes on a flow cell, what you requested as a format may not be the format that physically got ran. We may have had to bump it up because the, the machine can only do a single format for the whole uh, flow cell. So if you asked for a 518851 and we had to mix you with a 511251, then we physically ran 511251 and you've got extra cycles. Now, if you're dealing with the raw run folder, you'll have to know that because then when you specify the cycles that you want to use, you kind of can tell B cell to pass you too to ignore the parts you don't want. If somebody else has done that or whatever, you'll either see those bases or not, depending on whether the person that configured the conversion took the care to kind of cut everything back down to what you asked for, or just let everyone have the extra data. But if you've, if you've seen cases where you've had extra data, you know why, this is why, because we have to, we have to pull you on a, on a flow cell and other people on the flow cell may need longer formats than uh, you want. And there's two metadata files in the in the raw run folder that basically contain the information as to what the physical format was. So the numerals can be specified specified before the absolutely yes yes. How do you specify the numerals? Well, from the point of view of a core, uh, okay. So first of all, the, from the point of view of Illumina, Illumina only sell so SPS sequence by synthesis needs physical reagent for every cycle. Right, you actually need the fluorophores and the cleaver and uh, all this other stuff, buffers and so on. So when you buy the arrangements from Illumina, they come in a kit and the kit will have room for X cycles, but they only sell a couple Xs, right? So they sell a 51 cycle, a 50 cycle kit, a hundred cycle kit and so on. So they, they sell only a few kits. And so that basically from the point of view of a core turns into us offering you only certain formats because that's the, or that's the units that we buy the reagents in. Um, now we'll we'll get to actually this this little part up here is kind of getting related to your question, and because of the history was that indexing didn't exist, and so the kits still are named by the way they kind of were when indexing didn't exist. So a fifty cycle kit means that that's fifty main main read cycles in there plus a little extra because you know you don't you don't want to you don't want to run you know grab the last drop. There's a little bit of extra in there, so 
uh, 51, 52, whatever. You, 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 know, you don't want to push it too far, but there's a little bit extra. But then because of indexing these days, the 51 cycle kit actually has a lot of extra cycles, not just to not run dry because we got to run the index cycle as well. And so these days, actually a nominal N cycle kit is really more like N plus 36 plus a little more. Um, and essentially the instrument does, the reagents are the reagents. The instrument does not care how they're partitioned. You can, you can shuffle those between main N1, index one, index two, and main N2, however you like. Which is why you see like stuff like sometimes you run like 122 plus eight, which is kind of a weird format, maybe. But that's 130, which is really a hundred cycle kit piling most of the index reagent into main and one, extend main and one to one. And you know, I don't know. I I'm not sure how the other course looks on campus, but BSCRC, BSCRC were kind of like the the most researchy of the course, uh, doing you know, connected to kind of like the people doing the most weird things. I mean, in terms of like new protocols, protocol development, trying all kinds of things. We'll run, we'll run anything. You know, we'll, we'll, any kind of weird format you want to try, we'll generally do it. Some of the other cards may want to stick more to just kind of the whatever kind of formats they list. But basically in terms of what makes sense given the aluminum rating system, you can you get you buy an N cycle kit, you get N plus 36 plus epsilon, distribute that height however you like. Um, of course, if you want a really weird format, you know that nobody else wants to, you're going to have to buy a flow cell because because we can't we can't uh, you know we give you 122 we're taking you know we can't we can't give somebody else the long indices that they want with 100. So you know, anyway, but that's how it works. Anyway, that's how it that's how it works. Um, all right, so here's here's the throughput increase on kind of a graph linear scale. This one, the little inset is on a log scale, and you know, you just kind of see the, the craziness. You know, if you think of say like, what's a typical RNA seq experiment? You know, twenty million reads, twenty five million reads, you know, something like that. So here's here's a gray line at twenty five million. Like think of that as kind of like one x RNA seq or something. Well, here's ten of them, and there's a hundred of them, right? And there's one, ten, and a hundred of them. This is why everybody multiplexes now, right? Because we are long past the point. Where you can just do one sample in one line, uh, just it would just be insanely, insanely overkill. So at the beginning, it's kind of like tanks. You don't talk about gallons per mile per tank with tanks. You talk about miles per gallon. All right, all right. My, if you don't talk about miles per gallon with the tank. You talk about gallons per mile. Right, that's the right unit. That's kind of the way the original machines were. I think for the for the Nature BSC paper uh, that we did in Rabidopsis, which was the introduction of of, of WGS two. Uh, the scientific community that was, I'm actually the first author on that one. I think we ran, we needed 64 lanes for wild type and we had to run like 90 lanes because they like a third, a third of them failed or whatever. Right? So for one, you know, one condition, well, that it's not like that anymore, right? So now, you know, maybe when the high seat came along, a few people started multiplexing, but it kind of wasn't like, it was kind of if you know, and if you kind of had inertia from the past, it just kind of didn't. But by the time we got to um, the 4K, is the economics really were pushing you in that way? You're kind of well above this 10x RNA seq line here, and now with the Nova seq, it's just essential, right? Because you're up here at hundreds fold of an RNA seq experiment uh, uh, in terms of one lane, and the NSX is going to be uh, and, and even higher. Now, not all applications are sort of like overkill, right? There still are some applications that want super deep coverage on big genomes and stuff, and they they still could run one sample in a lane. But most of you are way way multiplexing uh, at this point. And the other thing that causes you to do it is that the uh, cost structure of the reagents really pushes you towards the highest throughput modes. So, you know, the throughput of an SPS one and S four is kind of like one x two x and six x, but the cost. Uh, is only like doubles, a little bit more than doubles the cost there. And that means the cost per sequencing unit, you know, whatever, that's why it's, you know, one SP is one unit or whatever. You know, it divides by three by the time you get to the S4 relative to the S4. So you want to run S4s. You know, as a core, we want your, you, you, you know, we, as a core, we don't make money. We try not to lose too much money either, but, you know, essentially our costs are your costs. And so you want to be here. Uh, um, because, you know, basically, you know, the cost we get is the cost we get. Um, so, and if you're still, you know, if, you're, if S4 is too big, 
and you got to find sequencing buddies, right? Now, sometimes the cores will serve as matchmaker for that, but we're going to show you there's a lot of danger in that, and that has to be done carefully. Um, uh, we'll, we'll talk about why in a second. Um, so, you know, different cores have different approaches. Some people are kind of mixing them more willy nilly. Others are kind of a little more careful in the mixing. Uh, others are kind of like only by sort of like informal collaborations of the, the lab users themselves. Like, I mean, the easiest thing to do is to collaborate with other people in your lab. That's the easiest kind of level. But you could also do other labs that are either near you or are working on the same kind of stuff as you, you know, other plant labs there or something, whatever. Uh, and then, if, you know, depending on how crazy you get, that, that may mean just sort of randomly with other people on campus or whatever. But I mean, there's different levels to the sharing. Um, but, you know, as we expect, kind of as novice X comes on and so on, the need for this is going to get more extreme. And we may, as a campus, have to come up with a more automated method of sort of matchmaking and so on to, to kind of make sense of this. So we, we ourselves are not quite as sure how we're going to kind of scale up this kind of process right now uh, of sharing. Okay, so let's talk about the actual, you know, we now have a pretty good foundation of language and so on and whatever. Let's actually talk about uh, DMUX. Okay, so the picture is like this. Okay, so um, get this thing. Uh, it doesn't want to. Is this the smallest you can make the Zoom thing? There we go. Okay, escape. We'll get him back. Okay. Okay, so. You know, I, I, I don't want to draw too much on the slides. So suppose you got three samples, three mice. Okay, there's the red mouse, the orange mouse, and the yellow mouse. Muxing is the process of physically mixing those prepared libraries into one tube that you're going to load onto a lane. And hopefully the indices, the, the embedded indices inside the adapters for the those we're live prepped with are different enough that we're going to be able to pull this apart at the end. Of course, nothing stops you from mixing whatever together as liquids. But you know, anyway, but the mux stage is the, you know, just basically pouring them onto one lane. The instrument, of course, has no idea what comes from where. It just supplies a sequencing primer, wells start glowing colors, it makes ACGTN strings, done. That's what the instrument does. So there's some process at the end here, which may be base space, BCL to FASTQ2, Illumina's new software tool is called BCL Convert. It basically does the same thing as, as BCL to FASTQ2. I, maybe this is the one they're gonna require us to use for Nova Seek X or whatever, but basically there's, it's just another implementation at this point. There's no, there's no reason to use it uh, or not use it yet, uh, but probably newer instruments will probably use the BCL convert. Um, so basically the DMUX stage is to do the reverse, which is to look at the only thing we get out of the instrument is sequences, you know, main ends and index reads. Those are the sequence features we have for read. We have to use that information to separate back out into the samples, right? So I think a lot of people kind of operate in the mode where they think of this part of the process or this whole kind of uh, cartoon up here is just some sort of magical and more or less boring black box. It does whatever it does, but we tolerate that because it seems to be mostly reliable and work and there's nothing else. What, I mean, what else are you gonna do? Um, and, uh, you know, there's ways in which that's a little true, but there's ways in which it's not true. Uh, and uh, the problem is, is that, uh, the extent of trueness of that just changes by orders of magnitude across lanes. And so if you're happen to be on the lucky side, great. But if you're happen to be on the hit hard side or even the moderately hit side, not so great. Um, and the, 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 the kind of the, the statement here that there's nothing else feasible to do, that's just false. Um, in terms of what number of samples we tend to see on a lane these days, here's just kind of a random sampling of kind of plexity, uh, as I'll call it. Plexity is the number of samples that have been mixed together. Um, so a threeplex, I'm showing you kind of a cartoon of a threeplex up here. Uh, this is kind of typical what we, we, we see. Um, you know, the, the high end is in low hundreds, typically. Um, the middle range is in the dozens, you know, dozens is very, very common right now. Uh, weirder cases are people when people start to mix things in different formats. Single end libraries with dual index, single index libraries with dual index libraries, and so on. We'll talk a little bit about that on day three. What happens when you start mixing uh, things together? Obviously, the sequencer primes and makes ACGTN strings. Something always happens. The question is, you know, those single index guys are going to produce some string in in dual indexing. The question is, what is it, and should we pay attention to it? And we'll talk a little bit about mixed case on on day three. All right, let's open up that black box a little bit 
uh, because this is you know really kind of uh, what it looks like inside. Here are some you know prepared molecules for these guys, and here is a variable portion of the adapter which has the barcode or tag or whatever you want to call it for each of the three mice. Then when the sequencer produces its, its output, we get things like tile XY coordinates, which have main read sequences, but also the index read sequences. And now we have this thing that we call a sample sheet, which is basically what we think is you know, supposed to have happened. Mouse one is supposed to be this, mouse two is this, mouse three is this. And then you know, with this column and this sample sheet, we can start to try to move the reads around into, into piles, right? So, oh, CGATGT, well, yeah, that's clearly mouse two, put that guy in mouse two. TTA GGC, okay, mouse three, put in mouse three. Uh, here's TTA TGC. Well, that's pretty close to mouse three. Yeah, it's one mismatch away. It's a lot further away from the you know, mouse one and two. It's probably a base call error of mouse three. We'll put that read in mouse three. Um, TCCCGA. Well, that doesn't really look like any of them. Uh, we're just going to put that in the dono pile. Okay, that's the DMUX fail or undetermined, you know, people give it different names, but, you know, basically there's always an N plus one pile and the thing you just stuff, you don't know what to do with it there. Um, most, all DMUX pipelines basically partition the reads into pile, output piles. Every input read goes into exactly one output pile. Sometimes people do things where like, especially in the mixed format case, like mixing single index, dual index, they'll start running in DMUXers multiple times with different subsets of sample sheets. There's a lot of reasons not to like doing that. and one of the reasons is that that can end up putting the same region in multiple output files. Um, but that's, that's sort of a more minor thing we talk about on day three. Anyway, so there's very much not trivial here because basically errors can occur and do occur at every one of these steps. And the errors come in many types, wide range of frequencies of uh, those errors, wide range of trigger conditions. Some of these you have at least some control over, even if you don't realize it and are making an implicit default choice. Um, and the impact varies from nil to you know extreme. You know, nil, you know, nil basically means it doesn't really matter if you try to address anything that did occur. Extreme means total project failure, right? Um, and you know, at the lower end of this, you may be being hit by this all the time, and you may not even realize it because you're just not looking. Just because you're not looking doesn't mean things don't happen. Or you may be ascribing some failures. Oh, those libraries didn't do so good. I'll try making them again or something. And or you know other performance, you may be ascribing that to the wrong causes because it may actually be a DMUX problem and not a wet bench problem. And some of these you can fix in silico. So the point here is that DMUX is really an analysis. It's not just something to something that it can only be done one way and you know does what it does. It's it's an analysis and it's a game. And basically trying to look at those index reads and given the knowledge of what you think is there trying to guess which sample each read came from. And so there's two things that can happen. You can miss DMUX, which means that a read originally came from one biosample, but you put it into the wrong DMUX pile. That's bad, right? That's equivalent, that's equivalent to cross-sample contamination on the wet bench, which you know, is something you really never want to do. The other thing that can happen is DMUX fail a read that really came from one of your samples got put into the don't know pile. That's less bad, right? Because at least it doesn't cross contaminate. And if that doesn't happen very much, that's okay. But if you have a lot of stuff going down there, now you're wasting, you know, what is that stuff, right? What, where you're, what, you're at least wasting sequencing energy, you know, your, your throughput isn't so good. So the yellow is the lesser problem, but as it gets, you know, it can become a serious problem if it gets to be a large fraction. But the, the red one, misty mux, is really nasty, right? So the goal of this mux sequence demux process is really to get both high selectivity, which is to maximize in each demux pile the fraction of that pile that's truly from the sample that we say it is, and high sensitivity, which is to minimize the size of demux fail. That's the goal. And in the common regimes that we operate in, those are a little bit in conflict. That's a little trade-off has to be made there usually people will tip the balance towards the selectivity direction, right? Because he, this cross sample contamination is a really serious uh, downstream problem. Um, whereas high DMUX fail is just lower throughput. Um, all right. So um, it actually may be helpful to actually think of DMUX as an alignment problem 
you're really aligning very short reads, index reads, to a very small reference genome, which is sort of the universe of possible tags. And in that universe of possible tags, there's a small number of those which you expect very high enrichment on, because of those are the libraries that you think are there and you think you've got, you think you know what tags you put on it. And so, like other alignment problems, just think of aligning, you know, RNA seq reads to the transcriptome or something, right? There's what can happen in alignments. Well, it's not like a read always goes somewhere. Some reads don't align well. Some reads align in multiple places. Um, you have to question the accuracy of your reference genome, the set of tags you're expecting. You have to question uh, the accuracy of the enrichment assumption. Um, you have to question how am I going to score these things, right? How do I judge mismatches and indels and unaligned edges of reads and so on, right? I mean, there's all anything that happens in in uh, an alignment problem, it really is has an anal analog here. And so that you, maybe you can start to appreciate where there are different algorithms and options and parameters and strategies you might use. And what's appropriate might depend on whether you're doing like a straight up very simple fourplex of equal representation, or that you've got 160 monsterplex, which has got eight people uh, sharing it. And some of the libraries are sequencing 30 times the representation of other libraries and so on. And some of the target indices are like two mismatches apart and others are like you know five mismatches apart. Anyway, the strategies you're gonna use are gonna depend a little bit on the situation. And the problem is that sort of the blind approach uh, doesn't really adapt at all. It's just kind of like always does the same thing and it doesn't have any of the dyna dynamicism to handle sort of these different situations. And now you may think that, well, whatever. I mean, index reads, how badly could they get sequenced? They're just short and like all the same is there something, um, you know, is, is there really that much errors to worry about there? Well, the answer is yes. Index reads look nothing like main end reads. The error profile in index reads is, is in, in its full generality completely bizarre compared to main reads. So your experience with Illumina main read sequencing error profile does not translate to sequencing error profile on index. And so, um, yeah, so there is a lot to do there in terms of like different strategies and optimizations and, and, and scoring and so on. Um, okay, so yeah, so we've, we've kind of already talked about this, but basically the impact of missed DMUX. DMUX piles are your sample identities in terms of the operation, operate, they're operationalized in terms of your bioinformatic analysis. So yeah, anything that, that makes missed DMUX is, is a serious problem because it's basically equivalent to, oh, I'm gonna dip my pipette tip in the red sample and I'm gonna take that loaded up tip and dip it into my green sample, right? You know, a wet bench guy would just go, you know, ah, you know, well, what about I start doing that lots of times or maybe I start commuting your, your tubes. Maybe I throw in some extra tubes in there. Uh, maybe I take one of your tubes and throw it in the trash can or whatever, all this happens. Um, and more than you might think. Um, and uh, if you're not allowing the DMX process to sort of even allow for these possibilities, you're not gonna realize always when they're happening. I mean, in the normal blind approach, what are your diagnostics that you have available? Very, very limited. Mostly, how, how many reads did you get in each pile? That's, that's like your only diagnostic really. So, you know, well, if all my piles are got something in them, I guess that's what I got, right? Well, no, not necessarily. You'll see why in a second. Um, and you're certainly not going to see guys that are extra there that are missing. Maybe you have some indication for like the percent of the lane that's in DMUX fail gives you some hint, like if that's big, well, what's in there, you know, whatever. But your, your indicators are very, very limited in the blind uh, approach. Um, and they're not really reliable indicators and they're not always very interpretable uh, indicators. Um, of course, adding new tubes is what happens when you do a uh, lane sharing. And because of this sort of the nonlinearity of the system here, adding things can do more damage than just reducing your coverage. You may think that if I add more samples in, what's the worst that can happen? Well, obviously some coverage moves to the new guys and so my coverage on my old guys goes down. Well, yeah, but a lot worse can happen than that. The new guys could have indices that are unusually close to ones you're already using and screw the whole thing up. The new guys could take over because maybe the lengths of their fragments are very nice for this platform and maybe your lengths of your fragments are not really preferred by Exam. He takes over 85% of the flow cell. Maybe his, we'll talk about this sort of low complexity problem, but if he has, if he has only like one or two samples, 
that can actually drive the Illumina uh, base color in the index, index cycles into a completely pathological place where it just gets all the base calls very wrong. And so your guys, which you know are left over, aren't you know they, they went to kind of zero because they're just not recoverable at all from the addition of this guy. So yeah, I suppose it's always a representation reduction if you allow total reduction to zero as a representation reduction. But yeah, so so adding things is not just uh, you can you know adding things has to be done with care and it can have much more extreme effects than just sort of a modest reduction in representation of the stuff already there. Yeah. Have you guys always add yes, BSCRC used to always add. So PHIX is a, a phage 154. Uh, it's about a 5K genome. It, it is a uh, reliable thing that Illumina can make in you know 50 gallon drums or whatever. Uh, it has a very even ACGT distribution. And so for libraries, say like by sulfite, uh, converted libraries, which are very poor in cytosines and very rich in, in, in thymine, um, we usually would spike in lots of PHIX to sort of bring the distribution of bases back to normal. It's sort of a, just a reliable library to sort of re-equalize very skewed distributions. The other function it had is that we used to routinely spike it in at 1% level to every lane because it served as a diagnostic as to whether the problem was with the user's library or with the instrument. If we see PHIX a little bit in there, at least we know the instrument's working. We don't see phi x, it's more likely it's an instrument problem. Um, so I don't know what the other cores are doing. I still think we spike in low phi x a lot. We also don't do that. I mean, you can certainly request that we positively do it or positively don't do it uh, when you request your sample. Maybe on day three, I'll talk a little bit more why our impression over the years has sort of drifted to the point now where we mostly think low spike in a phi x is a bad idea. Um, and so we try, we would recommend not doing that. And for libraries like by cytophyte and so on where the base distribution is very skewed and you have to do something to whiten the balance out, otherwise the instrument will go nuts. We generally recommend find somebody with a more, you know, you know, a whole genome library or an RNA seq or something that's more balanced that actually is useful and share your lane with them uh, so that both you get the brightening effect but also you're not just wasting half a lane in phi x or something, which is also not a good idea because phi x is only a single index, whereas sharing with somebody is more likely to give a nice spectrum of indices. One of the things you'll see in a moment is that a large fraction of the lane being a single index is bad. Um, I mean, if you're doing a one plex, that's okay because then DMOX is just put everything in the one pile. But as soon as there's two things, you don't want to have a lot of spots all calling the same sequence at the same time. It drives the base calling less. Um, so, you know, you want to always kind of plex at least, you know, like four or eight. And if you really only had two samples to run, you should really aliquot those into little batches and actually tag each of those with multiple distinct indices and then mix them so that each library would sequence with like two or four indices. And then you put them together. Now you have like eight or, or you know, 16 or something. You don't want to just have a two plus in the in the, base, in the index base calls will not work well. Um, yeah. Anyway, so um, yeah. Well, if, I mean, if you're, you know, most people these days. I mean, some people are doing experimental protocols or protocols are getting from literature, but you know, 90 X percent of what's run is out of commercial kits, right? Mm -hmm. And then each commercial kit either comes with one or several boxes, which have a fairly limited set of indices that are available, you know, 12, 24, 48, 96, 384, uh, so, you know, whatever. Um, and so when you do your project, you're pulling from that box. Hopefully that box is well designed within itself. We'll see on day three. No, not always. Uh, not even always if you stay within the same manufacturer. Um, not even if you always stay within, say, Illumina's ABC kit boxes from one of their product lines. No, it's not well designed. Um, so sometimes there are bad pairs in, in, in even single kit boxes, but hopefully at least the, you know, the, the guys doing the kit box that they're at least kind of did something right. So you're kind of okay yourself. The real danger comes to be when you start combining with people using other kits. Because there's absolutely no coordination between different companies. And like I say, even within different lines within a company, because typically a lot of the way these lines came to be under like the Illumina umbrella or something is Illumina just kept buying up the little guys 
And so they were really developed out of house randomly and so on. And once they're made, you're not gonna remake, you're not gonna redesign them to make them all nice, play nice with all the other kids. Would have been nice if like 12 years ago, we kind of all had like a big meeting and decided these are the indices that thou shalt use. You should use no other indices, uh, didn't happen. Um, so yeah, so uh, yeah, so when you start sharing, oh, absolutely, you got to pre-flight mixes. If you're going to share with a bunch of people, you need to figure out who those people are before you even start preparing a library, because once you put those tags on, you can't change them. And so uh, you need to coordinate with everybody that's going to share the link. Uh, uh, you got to keep our indices apart. So we'll, I'll give you a web tool to help you do that uh, tomorrow. Um, but absolutely, you got to you got to check that stuff because very very easy to get two pairs of indices from different kits that are two mismatches apart, even one mismatch apart. Two mismatches apart is generally bad news. One mismatch apart is really bad news. Um, I mean, you, you you kind of know generically how one mismatches are everywhere. I mean, they're not. Illumina is a good platform relative to like Nanocore or something, right? Where the bases are really bad, right? You know, like where eighty percent accuracy is kind of like what you get or something. Illumina is like 99% accurate, but that's 1% not accurate. When you've got 4 billion reads, you know, whatever. It's a lot of mismatch errors are out there. Um, and so, yeah, you don't want anything that you, you need to separate in two piles to be only one mismatch apart. Really bad idea. And that happens all the time if you start combining kits randomly. Um, let, let me another, say nothing. So, so I think again, I said kind of like when I say often in this workshop, I kind of mean like, you know, 5% of lanes or something like that. Well, that's, you know, that's true. But what also is true is that it tends to have correlations with things. So it's like some experiment types, some prep kits, some types of biomaterial, some, some labs, some wet bench hands. These are all correlates of kind of like push things in kind of the bad direction or good direction. And so some people will kind of go their whole career and like never have any of the problems I'm gonna talk about at all. And other people can kind of more reliably generate trouble. <laughs> uh, so, you know, again, it, it, it just kind of depends on what you're doing and who you are and whatever, uh, what these rates are. It, it's very hard for me to kind of give you an idea of what rate you're going to see because you are not seeing a core wide average. I, I only essentially know core wide averages of things, I, but I know that if you start slicing it in different directions, the, the numbers change a lot. So uh, it's definitely correlated with all kinds of things. Um, all right, more seriously, in terms of thinking about particular index types, what is MISDMX going to cause? Well, as the DMUX, MIS DMUX goes up, as the effective cross sample contamination goes up, what's gonna happen? Well, one thing that's gonna happen is say like an RNA-seq, your expression ratios are gonna degrade. And they're gonna degrade really fast for cases of sort of none versus not none, right? So if you have a condition where some gene is not expressing at all, and then you have some other condition where the gene is sort of moderately expressing or highly expressing, the ratio between those two is like crazy. Like, in, you know, I mean, it's infinity, literally, if this is a zero, right? But now suppose I start mixing 1% of everything together, right? Take 1% of you, put you in here, 1% of you, put you in here, whatever. Now what happens? Moderate and high expression into a zero becomes low, but something. And your, your infinity ratio is now a much more modest something. So this is one reason why like, you know, quantitative PCR or something might really disagree with RNA-seq or something. And this can be one of the reasons why, it's because your RNA-seq has actually got, you know, cross sample contam. And even 1%, which when we get to index hopping, is not a crazy level. We see that. That's at the high end of what we usually see, but that's not like a crazy level. Um, you know, 1% cross mix could really do something, uh, you know, to, to the more extreme uh, expression ratios. Um, your chip seek peaks will get muddy, right? You're basically averaging samples together, right? So um, if you're genotyping, uh, especially with marginal coverage, you know, like 3x, 4x, 5x or something, you're gonna start making wrong type calls. You're probably gonna start calling more hets than you used to, right? Because now you're now you're gonna get the occasional other samples genotype sitting out of place. It's gonna, you're gonna have coverage three, and this one is actually coming from another guy, and you're gonna probably now think this guy's a het, um, and so on. Um, if you're doing rare allele discovery in untagged complex mixes, yeah, that's gonna be problematic. Um, uh, in bisulfite sequencing, you're your your you know your five MC levels are going to start you know distorting, maybe for CG and CHG context not so bad, but maybe you're interested in CHH context where the methylation levels are very low, like one percent or sub one percent. Now a little bit of mix you know between your samples could be uh, something. So basically, what's happening is of course whatever you're studying, the signal to noise ratio is degrading, and if so, you're going to be most in danger when you're pushing the tech 
near its limits, even assuming none of these problems happen, right? So if, if, you're, if you're, what you're doing is, is kind of on the edge of the tech where even when everything's working well, it's like, you know, you're kind of right on the edge. Well, now these problems can, can you're gonna feel them a lot, right? But if you're sort of way back in a much more comfortable range and your science is really robust and your signals are super strong, is, is low levels of this gonna matter? No, right? So it kind of, it kind of depends. Um, yeah, so sometimes the damage is low, sometimes the damage is high, sometimes your susceptibility to damage is low, sometimes your susceptibility to damage is high. So then you've got different combinations. Um, uh, yeah, and we talked about DMUX fail, that's mostly just a coverage loss. But you know, these, these numbers aren't that far out there. You know, why throw away five or 10% or even 30% times of coverage in 10% or 1% of your lanes if you don't have to? And then rarely we get these lanes that are impacted much more. Anything up to looking things that look like a total failure. What's an easy way to get a total failure? You may know that uh, when you do dual indexing, when you compose the sample sheet, depending on what instrument you're going to run on, certain indices sequence forward or reverse complements relative to the other. Maybe you compose your sample sheet with the wrong orientation of your indices. All your indices are wrong. Usually the way kits work is that the reverse complements just land somewhere completely out. Very rarely do you get a palindrome as an actual index. And so if you've sort of composed your sample sheet and you've got the, you know, you didn't kind of read your documentation of your kit right or something, your sample sheet's all composed with like I2 is all flipped around, or maybe you swapped I1 or I2 or something. Probably nothing, you get you get nothing out, right? Total lane failure, but this easy fix, right? You know, whatever. Um, so that's just an example of how it can be easy to generate one of these cases. There are other ways that can happen where it's much more confusing than that, but uh, even simple mistakes can cause what look like total failures. Um, okay. Uh, so how are these issues even possible? Because um, like if you're extrapolating from your experience with sort of main reads, where Lumen is a pretty good platform, uh, very few errors, mostly mismatches, mismatches concentrated from the ends of reads, short reads, Shouldn't be a big deal, right? So, you know, aren't index reads easy to sequence? How can we have very many of them be wrong? The answer is no, they're almost actually the worst case for the instrument. Um, as they're nearly, I mean, these days we have enough index base calls, 36 cycles to spread to our indices. We could take care of a lot of these problems. And if we were better about developing the kits and kind of designing indices that were much more robust and so on, we could make pretty much these problems basically go away. But we're all stuck in sort of this world where people are still using like even six more indices sometimes, which is just nuts in today's world. Um, and it's because, you know, once a kit kind of gets out there and tested and people use it, it's a lot of inertia to do anything else, right? You know, like, you know, people are very reluctant to change. And so sort of these, these technical limits of earlier machines will haunt us for, you know, possibly forever. Um, uh, so the question is, since, since almost everybody is using kind of suboptimal kits relative to today's technology, we got to deal with the situation as it is because people aren't changing their library prep habits anytime soon. Um, so the problem is index reads, as they are currently used, basically poke the image analysis and base color RTA in all of its soft spots. Um, so the Illumina platform, as we talked about, was synchronous. All reads are at the same relative nucleotide position at the same time. And that means if you have a large number of reads, say a large number of your prepared molecules that say all have the same index, uh, you know, maybe 80% of the flow cell, uh, this can, especially this can happen if you're using old uh, single index uh, libraries and you run them in dual index mode, that usually what happens is that the second index goes somewhere in the adapter but it's the same, it's not a variable place in the adapter anymore. And so all of your single and single index libraries sequence with the same I2, say, or something like this. Um, so you know, you may think you have good index diversity, but really you're actually all your I2s are constant. You got, you know, you're combining with somebody who is dual index, and so you know, you know the, the, the lane is running in dual index. Well, you know, you may now be doing serious damage to the all the base calls of I2. You don't really care about the I2 base calls because you don't sort of need them, but the guys who are dual index do care about what's there. And you may blow up their second index because what's happening now is that say 80% of the lane is all gonna glow the same color at the same time. You're gonna get just a giant red, the whole puzzle is gonna go you know, red or something, right? On, on base one of index one. And 
there's a lot of the image analysis that's based on auto calibration, where sort of the idea of what signal intensities mean what is sort of used, the data is used to decide that itself. And so if you have extremely skewed base distributions, auto calibration can go wrong. And then there's things like the colony, we talked about the colonies having like a thousand molecular copies in them so that you get enough fluorescent signal and you can sort of macroscopically the image. Well, as the chemistry goes on, they're sort of desynced in those guys. Um, so the software has all kinds of corrections to sort of estimate how much of a fraction of the colonies are kind of leading and lagging and how much and so on. All this is auto calibrated and so on. Those are, those are even less sort of like exponentially sensitive things and so on. So like, as auto calibration degrades, there's sort of all these nonlinear tipping points because things are based on like quantiles and histograms and so on. And if you just push the algorithm in a, in a bad place, it'll just go from sort of behaving normally to just going nuts, right? It'll, it'll take the A cloud of uh, fluorescence intensity and start partitioning it into like the four bases or something, right? I don't know. It can do all kinds of crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. Um, you also get a little bit of optical bleed, you know? So like, you know, these, these, these spots are like nanometers a cup, right? You know what I mean? So, you know, the optics, they're, they're limited by the fraction that, you know, the wavelength or whatever. So spots are packed so tight that, you know, when one spot glows, you know, you get a little bit of that glow in the other spots around it too and whatever. I mean, there's all this deconvolution that's done and so on anyway. So you can imagine that, you know, when whole chunks of the flow cells start all going, hey, 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 then all the guys, the little guys scattered around are going, see, see, you know, see, uh, they're not going to always make it. Um, and so, uh, yeah, this, this is kind of one way that sort of like the index cycles are, are usually trouble for this because usually your main reads are much more diverse. You know, your main reads are all over some big genome. They're starting and ending all over the place. You don't have, you know, all the bases going one way at the same time. If you do, you may know that it causes trouble. Like some protocols will do that. Like if you're that restriction digesting and all of your, all of your uh, molecules uh, in the main reads will start at some particular sequence, the cup sequence or something. That can be a problem for the exact same reason. The problem with index reads is that it's much, much, much more likely that you have large sections of the flow cell all go in the same base at the same time. These low complexity index cycles. And, and so index reads really kind of exacerbate this, this soft spot of the Illumina platform. And so in its full generality, the index read behavior just becomes completely different than the, uh, than the uh, main read, uh, typical main read behavior. Um, we basically already went through kind of kind of this. Uh, the actual details inside R RTA, the base color and image analysis, they've changed many, many, many times since 2006. Um, you know, so, and basically as software revisions go by and as chemistry revisions go by, these instruments are not completely static. They do get kind of software updates once in a while. And sometimes the chemistry updates once in a while. And when that happens, sort of the edges where all these things can happen, move around and whatever. So. It's very, very complicated. It, you, what I'm saying is you can't really kind of like figure it all out and then sort of like know where the boundaries are very precisely and just sort of stay on the right side of the boundaries or something. No, it's, it's, in, it's an inscrutable black box thing, right? You just, you just have to avoid the situation it tends to cause them generically. You can't, you can't just sort of like, like engineer it down and get a real fine control uh, on it. Um, so yeah, so main reads, Typically, base color errors are rare, like 0.1% to 1%. Um, and they're generally mismatches, not indels, say. Uh, they're random, kind of scattered around. And, uh, you know, if I look at, if, if I had a, a lot of reads that went to the same place on the reference genome, I wouldn't see the same errors, the same place in those reads. The errors would move around in those multiple copies of the reads. And the errors do tend to concentrate at the ends of uh, longer reads. That's what you think of as the mental model for uh, an Illumina main read. And for indices, all of those things are basically false in full generality. I mean, you can have index reads that work fine. That's good. But when index reads in general across all lanes we see, they break all those things um, and break them extremely. Like in, it's not just like a little. So it's very common to have high frequency systematic errors, meaning that with indices, you do get the situation where you tend to see many, many copies of the same sequence over and over again, because it's essentially every one of your unique tags is going to sequence as many copies as you get molecules of it. So typically millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions. So you get to observe the same sequence sequence many, 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 many times. And what you will find is that the errors are totally not random in these guys. You may find that, you know, the sixth base likes to change from A to T, like 80, like, of the errors, I'm not saying that the errors are 
80, all the reads, 80% of the reads are in error. But if you restrict to the set of reads that are in error, you may find that 80% of those have the sixth base going from A to T, which is just doesn't, you know, doesn't really jive with your idea, you know, the idea of sort of randomness of errors, right? So they all pile up in kind of particular patterns. Um, and so that, that has a lot of effects. For example, that can happen so much that the error form actually dominates the unerror form. So the most common way that an expected tag sequences is not with the sequence that you think it should have. And it's not because the library reagents are wrong. It's because the machine has systematically corrupted this particular index in a particular way. And so it actually sequences out as something, the most common form it sequences at is actually not what you expect. So it's, some, it's like something you would completely, totally not expect from main reads, right? Okay, an individual main read could have some error. But if I look at all the main, you know, average over all the main reads, you know, if I pile up 50 reads on a chunk of the genome, the, and I pick the, the majority at least at each column, I'm gonna get the right base, right? You know, how, you know, what? But that's not how it works with index reads. And so you can already now see that, well, okay, if I get a systematic error that changes one base, well, maybe, if, you know, if the default mismatch tolerance of the aluminum tools is like one mismatch, that's it's generally its default. Um, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, then, uh, you know, maybe, okay, if that changes one base, that's it. But what if, well, what if two bases change, which can totally happen too. You could have a little dimer, base two and three change from AC to TG. Well, now you're outside the one mismatch tolerance. Now it looks like this sample has completely disappeared, right? Because you are in your sample sheet have got what you think is the right sequence, but due to these base color weirdnesses, this base color has now corrupted 80% of them into this two base corrupted form. And so there they all go, right? You know, so they just disappeared from, from the standard uh, one mismatch tolerance DMOX. Well, with the approach we'll take, which we'll look at a histogram of the actual indices in the lane, we'll immediately see there's this high, in, you know, literally in the top of the histogram, we don't see what we're expecting, but we see this guy that's pretty close. So that must be what happened. And so we can easily just change, realize what the change that the sample sheet needs, right? Uh, you know, without doing the histogram or something, you're left just completely guessing, right? Or whatever. Whereas we'll let the data actually tell us uh, what needs to be done. I mean, well, there'll be an interpretive part of that. We got to use our brain and think about what's going on. But at least we have sort of the evidence will push us in the right direction. We won't have to just sort of out of nowhere come up with what what happened among the universe of possibilities, which is very large. Um, in fact, the systematic errors I'm talking about don't even have to be small mismatches away. They can be indels away, which is something you really don't think of happening on the human platform. And indel errors in index reads can really come from two sources. It doesn't really matter where they come from. You've got to deal with them either way when they happen. You could imagine that the actual reagents that uh, are the libraries are prepped with may not have had the oligos synthesized perfectly. So you may have, we tend to not, you tend to not see that with commercial kits so much. We got a lot of people that run custom indices, right? And so they, how do they make their custom indices? Well, they had they sent out to get their adapters synthesized, right? So they had somebody synthesize the oligo. Well, they may not be perfect, but you know, so maybe sometimes when the chemistry synthesis goes, they lost, you know, some fraction of the molecules lost a base, didn't incorporate one of the bases they should have. It's effectively, it looks like a deletion relative to the thing. Um, that's actually probably the more rare form. It turns out that that at the level of index reads, the machine also tends to generate indels, kind of for some of the similar, the aluminum reversible terminator system isn't perfect. And uh, anyway, it doesn't really matter why, but basically, you will see in index reads, sometimes an indel variant of the intended sequence can be very high in frequency. 10% uh, relative to the uncorrupted form, possibly even higher. I mean, it's more rare than the mismatch corruptions we were talking about a second ago, but you can have even like indel forms that are like comparable to the, to the main guy or even slightly above. But the mismatch guys tend to go all over. Like, you know, the mismatch guys are you know, like 10%, 50%, totally outcompete the main guy or whatever. So yeah, so not only can, can you get mismatches, you can get indels. And not only that, you can get mismatches that aren't even close. So you can get where the intended sequence was this. And what comes out is like half the bases are wrong, more than half the bases are wrong. How do you even, and now you're like, how do you even know that's what it is then, right? Well, half, half away could be any of the guys in there. Well, yeah, sometimes, sometimes you know because it's like only one library has the problem. So this has got to be him. And then you can sort of check, you know, is it aligned to the right reference genome? And so sometimes you actually have redundant ways of demoxing that don't align with index reads at all. You may have an amplicon library where essentially 
you know, um, you know that you've actually amplified up, you know, little PCRs all over the genome, these particular primers and so on. And each of those are tagged with a different index. But actually, once you align them to the reference genome, the place they align to already tells you what the index should have been, right? So you can actually sometimes recover what the index should be just from the main read, say. And from this, you can sort of figure, you know, that, that kind of provides hard evidence as to where a read really came from, at, you know, because otherwise we don't, we don't usually have the, the, the luxury of sort of knowing the ground truth for the reads in terms of evaluating DMUX as a procedure. But from these special situations, sometimes we do have an independent way of getting the ground truth. And then we can evaluate DMUX directly and how well it's doing. And from that, some of those evaluations, we know that all the things I'm talking about really happen. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, today I'm sort of scaring you a little bit. I mean, it's, 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 it's not, you know, I'm basically conditioning on problems in this talk, right? You know, it's, you know, I'm taking the distribution of things that happen, immediately throwing away the majority of cases that are all fine and good, right? And, and the probability conditioning here is on the, on the assumption that something goes wrong. So, you know, it, it's worse, you know, it's, you know, don't take it quite as bad as I'm saying, but, uh, you know, once errors do happen, you do get kind of this whole spectrum of things uh, that happen. Um, yeah, so down here at the bottom, most lanes indices have errors that are more like main reads. And assuming no sample sheet errors, that means the mindless blind, one mismatch too much tolerance to the sample sheet that you originally came up with, that's not a terrible way to go. Right? That's that's majority of lanes. But most is not all. There's a lot of lanes that don't fit that. And it's it's an absolutely large number of, of projects and samples that are impacted. And that's what this is all, all about. Of course, the assumption that there are no sample sheet errors, uh, that actually fails way more than you think. Um, uh, people can have be, the, the actual mix that ran on the machine could be missing components. You know, as a core, we really try to avoid mistakes. I think we're pretty, we're pretty good. I, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't really want to compliment ourselves too much, but you know, I think we do do a pretty good job about not making mistakes because usually when we are able to identify problems, it's almost always on the user side. Um, it's very small number of cases that the, because you know, sometimes we're the ones doing the final mix that gets loaded on the lane, right? Some people already provide, you know, are buying whole lanes themselves. They give us ready to go uh, stuff. Other times we're combining from several users and making a share tool and so on. And then that's us doing the final mix. Of course, you know, when mixing, whether it's yourself or us or so on, you know, the constant, you know, there's a serious issue of like quantification and so on, right? You know, you're going to mix 50 samples and you haven't done something somewhere to control the effective concentration of those, you're probably going to have a bad day when you mix them together because one of them might be come sequencing out a hundred times the rate of the others or so on, right? You, most people, when they mix, generally want an equi mix, meaning that they would like relatively equal amounts of sequencing on all of the components of the mixture. And the only way that happens is either the library prep itself has some sort of built in thing that controls the concentration. I mean, it, you may not actually have gone through the trouble of actually quantifying them individually. That's always ideal when you can do it, but you know, as plexity goes up, people don't want to do that. You know, like you get to 384 plexes and stuff and people don't want to really quantify each of those 384 independently and then carefully titrate them out and get them all at the next. You, you hope that the prep has sort of like gotten them all in sort of a range, right? So you can just sort of dump them all together at that point. But you don't want to have it just be completely uncontrolled. So it's just sort of wild orders of magnitude variation. Anyway, so um, yeah, so you know, you hope that the you know missing components uh, can be you know wet bench errors like that and so on. Um, uh, here we're restricted to sample sheet errors. So things like here we're assuming that the base color hasn't gone crazy and generated all the problems we were just talking about a few minutes ago. Here we're talking about machine went well, it's one, but the sample sheet is an error. Okay, so. Um, for some reason or not, extra components also seem to be fairly common. Uh, you know, I don't really know how that happens. Um, I don't know. I guess people have a bunch of stuff on the on the bench. I don't know. Yeah. Um, everybody uses like the best through twelve first, and so but never like thirteen through like thirty-two, and so you end up with this. And also, point means that the entire space has just got every index on every surface of everything around, right? I, I don't know. So, you know, and anyway, it, 
sometimes I think it's miscommunication or sometimes maybe you were sharing with someone in your lab and then the other person changed their idea of what they wanted to do, but didn't tell you, you know, whatever. I mean, because sample, I think a lot of times people, you know, they're in a race to get their sequencing submitted. They just kind of compose the sample sheet like really fast at the end or whatever and just throw it over. Um, so I think sometimes in, when you kind of got multiple people involved, it doesn't always come together all at the end. You know, anyway, it seems to be, it's fairly common uh, to find empirically, you know, in say a 26 plex mix, it's really a 30 plex mix empirically. And you can really believe the other, the other four components are really from the lab or something because it will, you know, it's from the same kit box. It aligns to the same genome, you know, whatever. It's the same type of experiment. Uh, you know, it might be, you know, it aligns to the transcriptome. So it's an RNA seed experiment. You know, anyway, you know, I, you know, I have less visibility into the other side, but I, I just know from my side, when I went to look, you know, if you don't look for them, you didn't really go find them. But, you know, I, I, didn't, I did 600 lanes uh, just from scratch. You know, I, I, I don't see the sample sheet. I use the data to tell me what's going on. Then I look at the sample sheet. And so, yeah, I, you know, dozens of cases where you have extra components uh, that weren't listed in the submitted sample sheet. Wrong expected indices for components. We talked about some of that. Like sometimes the second index orientation depends upon the platform and stuff. And so people will get, will give you a, a file where all, of, all, the sam all the indices are sort of backwards, you know, reverse, reverse complementing where the I1, I2 needs to be swapped. Oh, the web page people sometimes call the uh, I1, I7, and they call the I2, I5, because that's the terminology used in the Illumina documentation that is, you know, like in the, in the kit manuals and stuff. That's the, I, I don't know why. Uh, I, as a bioinformatics guy, we, we always have first and second index because we don't care what timer or whatever, maybe whatever, the machine did, did something on the first index and something on the second index, and that's the artifact that we deal with. You know, what, what you want to call it on the other side, we, we don't really care, but, but very often the first index is called I7 lowercase i, and the second index is called I5 uh, lowercase i. And just remember that they're always backwards. The seven is seven five. It, it, it's not five seven up up one two. It's the reverse order. Um, uh, there's 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 all kinds of reasons too. Like Illumina, like in their UDIs, their unique dual index kits, they went through a stage where they had like a secret revision and they like changed like a few of the indices. So there's like a UDI fifty five B one and a UDI fifty five B two, and there's actually no indication on the physical box which one you have. Um, you have to go and look at your PO and look at the part number you ordered to find out which one you, you ordered. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, just all kinds of things can happen. And you know, it's not always your fault, but, it, but uh, yeah. Oh, and once in 15 years that we've been doing sequencing, uh, very strange case, ended up being resolved as intralab sabotage. Um, uh, that's always fun. Um, you know, and, so, and sometimes, you know, you can pair the missings and expected. So 24 plex, 22 of them are obviously present as expected, two are missing, but then you go digging in empirically and you find two extras. Well, there's your two. Now you've got to figure out which one's which. Um, sometimes, sometimes you can make a good guess because maybe it's D5 and D6 in the box. And it came out as E5, E6. You know, so probably D5 is E5. But you know, anyway, never a good position when you start, you know, having to refigure out what you think your sample labels are. But you know, I've had projects where we had to do that, right? Where, you know, there was one project we did like 56 RNA seq samples and uh, in various conditions, and it was so clear biologically from certain genes, like which condition each sample had to be from. But like our labels told us that like these two were these two other conditions, but there's just no, there's just no way. So you, you just have to assume there was an unintentional swap um, and carry on. Um, yeah, and then one more thing which we'll talk more about on day three, which is even absent anything we've been talking about, no base collar sample sheet errors, no gross wet bench errors, index read perfectly matches an expectation, still doesn't mean that that read comes from the mark sample because of this phenomenon called index hopping. Um, and there are multiple mechanisms for that. Um, but basically what it means is that at some point in library pepper on the instrument, the wrong index got put on the wrong molecule. And so the machine's working perfectly well. That is the molecule it's seen. 
but it means that the pairing, the, the, you know, the actual constructed molecule has a wrong pairing of biomaterial and index. I mean, one of the ways this can happen is you've got free indices floating around at a time when they're not really supposed to be there, right? So you still have unattached you know, uh, adapters waiting to find somebody to meet with. And if they, if they find, uh, you know, if they find a, a molecule that they can uh, ligate with or whatever, well, now you've got one of these misattachments or whatever. So that could be during exam, that could be during library prep, you know, maybe you're not perfectly clean. Uh, before you start mixing things together, you start some activating. So I mean, this is not supposed to happen. Every library prep protocol that does indexing has got steps that are designed to, you know, not have this happen, but it still happens. This probably ubiquitously happens at like the 0.01% to 0.1% level. So like one in a thousand, that's like ubiquitous. Um, 1% is the upper end of what's common. And maybe that's starting to get to the level that you actually do have to worry a little bit. And when it's bad, it can go up from there. And we've seen 15% and so on, things like this. And these are things you really want to diagnose when they happen because like 15% cross sample contamination, that's serious. Um, and when we'll talk about index hopping. And you, this, this is what essentially leads you to unique dual indices. And unique dual indices are your defense. So we'll talk about that on, on day three. And the answer is dual indexing. Oh. So, so the idea is that with dual indexing, you arrange so that the first index and second index are each uniquely enough to identify the sample. But then if you ever see the wrong pairings, you know, so it's supposed to be one, you know, one, one left and one right, two left, two right, three left, three right. But if you see three left and seven right, that's not good. That's that's a hop. Um, and so now some of those hops will randomly hit guys that are good. But with unique duels where you only do kind of a one-to-one -one pairing, almost all of the swaps end up going someplace bad. And so you'll lose the representation, but you won't have them contributing to misdemeanors, right? So you much rather shuffle them off to demux a fail uh, or misdemeanor, you know, but get them out of the misdemux file. I mean, you can't pull them back anyway. You don't know which sample they really came from, but uh, at least you're not gonna have them cause your misdemeanors. Um, so yeah, I actually already talked about this slide. Um, I've, I've made a lot of claims. I haven't shown a lot of supporting data. How do I know all this stuff? How do we know it's not just theoretical and so on? And the answer is, um, I already talked about it a bit and how you can actually use sometimes the, the other ways to confirm sort of uh, what the identity of the samples is. And so sort of, uh, um, you, can, you can really convince yourself that this is, I mean, we all have mechanisms for all these things and so on, but then you can actually confirm in some cases this really happened. So, so the, the reason why I kind of, I ended up doing these 600 lanes was because I knew my personal sequencing history goes all the way back to the first sequencer on campus. And in that time, it was very different. Like the whole machine was manual. It's like manual focus for the optics. You did the, you did the base calling uh, on your own Linux machine. You actually got like TIFF image files off the instrument and actually like really did image analysis and so on. I ended up actually writing my own base caller uh, for the uh, Nature uh, bisulfite paper um, that, did, that did a better job with the sort of the distorted distributions we had uh, in the ACGTs there. Um, anyway, so I was used to sort of this mode of thinking. I sort of knew what went on. I knew how the sausage was made. And I knew that sort of like, well, the, the, the thing was, so for a long time, we didn't do DMUX for you guys at all, right? And our user base was kind of small and, and fairly sophisticated and um, DMUX was the responsibility of the submitter uh, because I, I knew, I mean, the, the, what to do with DMUX depends upon your situation. But then, you know, by 2000, what, you know, whatever, 19 or something, we got the NovaSeq and it's like, user base was much bigger and, and the samples much more complicated and so on. And there was real demand for DMUX, like the other, the other cores were already doing it on campus. And so on, of course, they always do the blind DMUX. Um, there was a real demand for us to also, as BSCRC, to do the, the DMUX as a service. So given what I knew, I couldn't really, you know, like kind of do cautious, just kind of like do the blind DMUX, at least without really kind of seeing what the user base is really gonna be like and so on. So, you know, at the beginning, it was kind of manageable. I mean, it was, you know, I was doing every NovaSeq lane in the way I would describe it tomorrow, you know, this whole process, uh, every Nova claim that VSCRC core did. Um, and, you know, it started out not too bad, but then it eventually became like a quarter of my time and then like half my time. 
And then it was like 100% of my time. And then it became more than 100% of my time. It was like completely unsustainable. Um, and so we had to stop doing it. So by the time I stopped, it was like quarter three of 2021. Um, I had done you know, more than 600 lanes, thousands and thousands of hours uh, on it. The side effect is basically everything I'm telling you now. I learned, you know, this, discovered all of these, all these things that happen, um, developed bioinformatic procedures to identify and, meet and remediate them. And basically one of the major motivations for this workshop is to sort of communicate some of this so that you guys can decide for yourself to what degree you're concerned about this and to what degree you want to implement this, this approach. Like I said, there's all kinds of levels of it that you can do from kind of minimal, just a, here's a real short list of things on the end of day three, I'll give you do and don't, right? That's the easiest thing to do. Um, but then you can sort of gradually implement the steps of this, of this approach, like at least look at the histogram of the index weights and stuff, that's easy to do uh, and still quite informative. So, and at least if you get in a situation where you're able to just sort of like know that a lane has got issues, you can at least call us in for support at that point or whatever. It's more like I can't just afford to do every lane and check myself whether it is to find the smaller set of lanes that really need extra attention. I need to off offload uh, that, that process. Um, all right, maybe, so maybe uh, we didn't really take a break last, so let's, you know, let's take a five minute break or whatever here and uh, then we'll, we'll continue. And if you've got any questions, I mean, you've been asking questions as we go, but uh, everyone wants to walk around. <laughs> oh, you got to go. <laughs> Is there a sewing machine? Sewing machine? Oh, like an Emmy? Yeah. Uh, Eva usually handles that. Uh, you can just. Uh, You got a pen? Yeah. Let me just take off the. You're on there, right? Yeah, I'm on, I'm on here. So yeah. Yeah. Just, just make a mark. I'm going to put a one for day one, I guess. I don't know. Elo, I thought usually, Elo usually keeps track of it. Just yeah, I think that's, I think that's what happened. Thank you. I mean, everybody here has done quite a bit of sequencing already, I think, right? Yeah. No, no, because we have a terminator on the floor for the terminator and floor for incorporate. The terminator stops any further reaction. So we just let the, all the reactions, you know, we, just, we just give it enough time that all the reactions run into each other. So all, all the molecules in the colony will have a terminator to incorporate their own base. They will not go further. But then because of the terminator, it just holds. So after the two minutes of pass or whatever, uh, for incorporation, and you scan. So, and while we scan, nothing is happening. But each trace, the addition of each trace is the that's caused by the terminator. That is still X. The terminator is what makes it a synthesis. So, and so, and so while the terminator is on there, we can take all the time. Although, I mean, not really, but I mean, you, know, you don't want to go too long. I mean, you know, it's all balanced, but, the, but there's no like immediate thing. It's not like it's not millisecond. <laughs> Why is it one of the Oh, it's how you cycle. Yeah, yeah. 
the reason why we can't do cycles forever is because uh, eventually the individual modules break. Either either the laser gets them, or uh, so they just stop working, or they or they just the system ground break, the system falls apart, or they, or they get too far out of sync. So you've got a thousand modules in there. Well, if the chemistry is ninety nine point something percent good, it's one percent not good. And then on cycle one, nine hundred ninety nine modules are on phase two, but one module is somewhere else. Well, by the time you cycle 100, you know, now the main percent is like you've got a 20 percent difference. At some point, the desync is so bad, you can no longer rely on it. Or just things getting darker on the planet. Just molecules are falling apart, the desync is no longer controlled. So eventually, it's just, it's just, eventually, it gets so dark and so spread that desync is so bad. You have to read like Jonathan a little bit. So the, the GA1 is just 27 bases initially. 27. Like, like, yeah, that, that, we actually weren't as, we weren't the first one to use GA1. By the time we got a GA1, it was 36. You know, but you know, and that's like 15 years ago. So there's been this slow increase to you know what's the longest you can get. Depends on the instrument. Some of the only instruments would be 250, 250. It's not very good at doing that. Know, that's 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 essentially what hack bio is good for. It's essentially, they're the they're the long range class. They can do a couple kilobits, tens of kilobits, but they're of course the per base accuracy is terrible. Well, actually, they're newer than this. The long time is probably like eight years, close to nine years. In the hack bio, they just take the same So much much higher energy. Yeah, so nanopore, I mean, the main advantage of nanopore is that you've got like no capital investment, right? So if you want an aluminum machine, like, like a NOLA, that, that's like half a million dollars plus. And that thing can be $50,000 a year if you load it up. And you can, I mean, if, once you buy one, you might as well run it because that thing's depreciating. Um, so that thing burns. That thing will, if you don't have the demand for it, should not buy it, right? It's just, it's just too expensive. It's just going to be burned. Um, Hack bio also very cheap. Um, Nova or Nanopore, so they have a couple of machines, but the smallest machine, the Minox, is like a USB free device, right? You just plug it into the side of your laptop. The flow cells, which have all the electronics, are disposable. Right? I mean, it's, it's like the Essentially, what you plug into the USB thing is just kind of like a power supply, and it's like a plastic shell, right? And then you just plug the flow cells into it, which have the little drip port and the USB sample, as long as you also have the silicon chip that does the thing. Um, so, anyway, so the, the you know, it's like five hundred dollars or so. So you're, you might as well be zero, right? If you have this stuff, really. And you, and you know, they've got this funnel stuff, you know, they've got the girls. Walk into volcanic landscapes, get their probe into the sulfur pool, and like see if it was right on the spot. You know, yeah, that's cool. It's, I mean, it's, it's like Star Trek, right? At that point, right? I mean, it's basically like a micro version of Star Trek. A lot of these guys are like Star Trek. Um, but throughput is terrible. Base call accuracy is more or less terrible. Green lights can be pretty impressive, but not, you're not doing that on the volcano. Like they just, just crop up. Okay, now gave them a pretty bad data. Set. They gave the data, right? They had a tough one. You're not going to be carrying them your back like that. I know it's you. Um, you know, you probably weighed about 600 pounds. Um, anyway, so I mean, it's, you know, whatever. Every platform has got strength. Now, Luna is getting the first competition this year in a long time. So MGI, there's a whole bunch of platforms that are coming. Uh, quite a bit cheaper. Um, you know, I, I, whether you want to call it lab scale, I mean, Illumina, Illumina also has a range of machines. You know, they've got like the, the IC, they've got the IC, you know, they, whatever. They, they have a range from, from the X thousand to the town. But, the, you know, maybe the lower end of the you can call it lab scale machine. You know, like Richard Packard. And maybe some of these Illumina competitors are also um, um, lab scale. 
the, the nanopore with the midnight. You know, that, that's even the cotton scale at the bottom, right? You can do that. You can you can buy one yourself and do it at home in your garage, right? Yeah, that's cool. I mean, that, like if you if you were at a high school or something or whatever, or you could get a grant from a public school or something, you could probably just do that and have them there. Um, so the the you know the nice guys is it, the problem is uh, there are also a lot of uh, you, know, you can although because the throughput is so much lower. Right, right. Yeah, so it's a, yeah, it just depends on what right. you use the IC. Some people, some people might use the IC as a library value more than they put it on its own. So if you need to turn the library very deeply, so it was very important to check that the library works well before you put it for a lot of secrets to come away. Yeah, one of the IC. Amplicons, you could. Well, I mean, at the time, you could totally just well, store multi bytes on it. So the property when you talk about email, probably as well as applies. I mean, yeah, this applies to basically any of these email platforms because they're all basically the same thing. What, what is an IC if it's basically like this, but take away the fancy laser scan, one D scanning camera, movable stage, and just put a fixed 2D camera looking at a fixed spot, right? Very small field of view, very small imaging area, but Way cheaper because you just got rid of most of the hardware. So, um, yeah, and that's basically what an IC is. It's like, it's like a single pile node. Instead of a, you know, it's a good like what, like 800, 900 pile or an IC because it's a one pile. It's just a 2D or whatever. A DPD camera with a digital market. So, we don't cover. You know, like a lot of people think it's You know, is it any different? Oh, yeah, 10 so 10 minutes, yeah. 10 minutes is like its own. Yeah, they're all. So, um, however, in terms of DMUX, Cell Ranger is just a wrapper around DSL to pass you to. It just, whatever command line options you pass to Cell Ranger DMUX, basically just go directly to DSL to pass you to, and Cell Ranger adds some more in its own. The general cell ranger will also support the sample key. So you can also you can also totally bypass cell ranger DMUX by just composing a similar looking sample sheet on your own and just running DMUX and all the usual things. Again, use the same output. Most mostly the 10 x stuff is just really sensitive like how samples are named and all that stuff. So like if you I mean you may have data that exactly kind of are form, but it's not like named exactly right in the right. But yeah, you can you can all this stuff applies to Canix too. But uh, yeah, I also have a question for you. So you know what have a single text So if I take my samples, those single text are equal to can you I don't know if there's a different index for all the samples? Can I run them at the same time? Can in the sense will it physically work? Of course it'll physically work. Build a machine generator. Of course, it will be a What do you do with the data you have? So, most people in that situation, without knowing anything about that tool, will handle the DMUX by running the 10x Python twice once with a single index only sample sheet and once with a dual index only sample sheet. And there's an expectation that something else happens in the data that's not going to DMUX in each of those runs. Just going to get some huge amount of some random stuff, which is related to the other samples that you can bother to tell us about. Um, that is the case of what I'll talk a little bit about on day three, which is a text format one. The way I recommend handling this is actually to figure out what the smaller diagram would be. In this case, it would be the single index size. Empirically, figure out what the single index size looks like in the second one. Essentially, just make a single, do a single DMUX run with a full. An extended uh, sample sheet that handles both of those problems, filling in the second index column with what you know is working and why not. Single index size is working. Um, and the reason you kind of want to do it that way is because you really need to see kind of how close the signals are getting to the noise and stuff. And you, you kind of want to see the interactions are there when you get these 
I mean, I mean, the doing two separate ones would be nice. It's always used for output and maybe the time on, but if you didn't do anything to kind of check that time clock back in the beginning, so my approach was sort of try to treat them as a unit problem and essentially lift the signal into a dual. Because you got sequences there, and it like never happens that like, like I said, these days, because of the two color chemistry, even if the sequencing timer doesn't bind to the second index set, it would still come out as color. It would not be like random sequences. It would be something special. It's not going to be. You're going to get some. But 10x, that would make that more complicated. As soon as you deviate from solid into this way. The number one reason why people think is well known to be well known. That's the most recent question. 10x likes to start over and take over the whole content, starting right off the top. It's just. In real reality, what Tenex does is really not that complicated. They just wrap it in a lot of biometric infrastructure that can be sensitive to people. So they've got like the whole, uh, the whole like the cluster interface module pipeline thing. Uh, they've got the whole infrastructure that has the multi processing. And then they've got the, so they want to take over the DMOS. And I mean, in a way, it makes sense. Yeah, because they just kind of want to make it easy for their users in a way. It's just that as soon as you kind of, it doesn't always integrate, like as soon as you mix 10x with other stuff, like it, it just, this doesn't play, you know, if you have a pure 10x lane, fine. But people will mix it with all kinds of things. So, you know, when, you, when you're basically not in the use case of the documentation, you don't have to pay any attention to the scene. And then 10x has no support. And then it's like, well, you're not following it right. So, uh, a lot of we got a lot of your kind of talk about a lot of this because it's just it, as soon as you try to do anything that's not like triple letter, it's just it becomes a problem. And then somebody's got to figure out how to get it. Usually, that somebody isn't there to help you get it. And you can talk about <laughs> yeah. A lot of our angriest customers are just going to be there. Yeah, they're another uh, competitor. We have no direct experience with any of them oh. as of yet. You know, you, you know, every UC campus has a student support. Like some of them have more than that. We have three. Although we're kind of unified now. It's right. a really weird time. Um, our price schedules are now unified. I think we're starting to look at maybe like whether our sample submission and tracking might become unified for a lot of reasons. Dylan would love to be involved. And also, this, this lane sharing thing is going to become a serious issue. I won't we'll complain all this by another time. But you know, a hundred typical length of like hundred. When you want to run this thing, because if you're not running it, you really want to have to finish the you have to infinitely more users. So to put it this way, the number of samples per week you have to have to handle is going to go down. I think I think in, in the history I've been I've been with APS Sleep Corp from the beginning. I think we've done more than three thousand flow cells. The average flow cell used to be eight dollars a month and now we're at like four. So I multiply that by five if you go at twenty cells, that's fifteen thousand now. How many lane samples are you have in an average lane cell at the beginning of the flow is one, but now it's in like a hundred. Have you done a third of the samples possible? There's a, I think there's a price schedule for outside. You have to be more. 
You can also define it in terms of like the scope. You know, like nebula genomics are like things where you can just apply it. You can just they'll send you a cheap swap. You can do your own genome. Uh, yeah, I think it's only like it's only like two hundred dollars. Yes. CSRC members is just like the CSRC plus is only the same as that group. There's another schedule, I think, for Catholic non affiliates. There's probably another schedule for. Because of the unified prices, all sorts of methods. What they, so one thing the CRC doesn't do is we don't allow the shipping profile or allow the shipping profile. That's another reason why we don't have to see the extremely diverse. Because we have effectively, we're getting leverage from tons of different things. Very diverse. The Shinmin is getting a little more regimented by the same, the same, same kit, same group. So he has a little more, he has a lot more predictability. We kind of see the whole. Which is another reason why it's very hard for me to kind of just grade the kind of things that happen fall in the You know, for a core like Shinman, it's very different. But it's not much like Shinman. There are more predictability. Yeah. Oh, oh, she's not coming back. That's right. <laughs> yeah, okay. So anyway, okay, so we got an hour, right? So, all right, so, um, yeah, so let me let me kind of now more get close and talk about the specifics of how the two approaches work, the blind approach and the sort of bottom-up data-driven approach that uh, I take. I don't know how much of the audio picked up our discussion there for, it was like 20 minutes or something, I don't know. But uh, anyway, here is the conventional, kind of blind approach that almost everyone on the planet, I think, is doing in terms of demuxing Illumina data. And that is, you get the raw run folder off the instrument, right? So that already contains the base calls. RTA is inside the instrument now. And uh, essentially the, the ACGT ends and Q scores, they're all in there, it's all done. It's in 20 binary files, but it's already. Um, and then of course we need the SAM machine, which is your best guess as to what actually happened. Um, and uh, those go into generally one of three programs. I think probably on campus, base space is the most popular. That's Illumina's cloud platform. Um, it runs off Amazon EC. Uh, and uh, you, you generally, I think, I think they, I think they get you the, the money comes from the fact you have to pay for storage. So run, you know, you know an S four, a Nova S four lane. You know, it depends on how many cycles you run, but if you run like 150, 150 S4 lane, uh, that's a terabyte and a quarter of raw run folder, something like that. I mean, I mean, you know, computers are pretty big these days, but you know, well, then you do a hundred of those, right? <laughs> you do. I, I think, I think personally, in terms, I'm still managing barely to hold on to all the data we've ever generated. It's about 380 terabytes right now. Um, and I really have to start doing that now. So uh, anyway, it does end up that is a serious issue at some point. You get to some point where the, the space, you know, low, low turn. I mean, you can go to Black Friday sales and get like a 50, 16 terabyte USB hard drive disk for like what three hundred dollars now, something like this. You know, so on the level of a lab that can that's doing, you know, moderate amounts of sequencing, that would be okay. Probably should get two of them and back it up and put more bits in the cloud. Um, you know, as you get to bigger labs, storage really becomes a problem because now you're talking about, you know, tens of terabytes that have to be, you know, this file, you, you need some sort of RAID system or something, or, or if you're starting on the cloud, you know, cloud storage is very expensive uh, because the cloud guy has got to put it somewhere. He's generally got a pretty fancy system to do it because he scales pretty big. 
and he wants to make a profit. So, you know, so cloud storage is, is always a cost estimate. And so I think basically it's charges you like per, you know, per gigabyte per month, some whatever. They'll, they'll phrase it in something that makes it sound cheap, like a penny or something, but no. And, but then you got to really got to keep multiplying by thousands of terabytes. So, and then months go by, right? Then it's like times 12 for a year, and it goes up. Anyway, so base space, usually, in fact, the way we run the instruments these days is that the instrument, as it sequences, the RTA, RTA actually stands for real time analysis. So RTA image analysis based on actually proceeds concurrently with the run. I think it has to go to about cycle 26 or so before it sort of gets enough data to sort of start the base calling process. But after that, it basically sort of, as a cycle comes in, it calls 26 cycles ago or whatever and just rolls along. And so by the time the run physically finishes imaging, the last imaging cycle is done on the instrument, RTA is almost done based on the whole thing. Um, and then the way we typically run all the cores typically run is that the instrument is uploading to base space as it goes. And so uh, once the run physically finishes imaging in another couple hours or so, uh, the run is uh, fully uploaded to uh, base space. And at least our core, we always keep a local copy too. The instrument talks Windows, uh, SMB, CIF, or file sharing. So you just have a Windows network file sharing. It dumps, dumps a copy of the raw run folder also locally. Um, uh, you basically need gigabit Ethernet, but gigabit Ethernet is basically barely enough to keep up. Yeah, yeah it's comfortable, but it's not like too, too many factors over, over uh, you know, margin. Uh, it's basically gigabit Ethernet is it is barely, oh, here comes the with this, with this attendance, I think. Uh, yeah, she had to go. Oh, oh, that's um, that's uh, Lauren. Uh, yeah, the negative is barely enough to sort of do the upload and the local copy or whatever. Um, the inside base space, I mean, we don't get to see the code inside base space, but it's probably mm -hmm. HCL fashion too, mm -hmm. which is a software package you can get from Luna's website. Um, they have a, a Linux version. I'm not sure whether they have the Windows and Mac version, but everyone runs it on Linux. So, so on campus, if you don't have a Linux machine handy, often do if it's possible. If we get to it at the end of today, we will do a often to do some of that CP run. Um, uh, so that takes some command line parameters, uh, some of which would be exposed on base space, some of them aren't. Um, you do get more control with these old fast CP than you can get base space. I think base space allows you to read. You can upload a new sample sheet and read Emux uh, a run. I think there's a five time lifetime limit on that. So any run can only ever be Emux five times. If you're just randomly guessing and so on, that can go pretty fast. If you do my approach, you only want to do one cycle. You just need one data derived cycle and it tells you kind of what you got to do. Um, uh, VCL to convert, as we talked about, is the new, new version of VCL test me too. It basically has the same features. Uh, maybe a little less features because it's sort of a kind of speed. My guess is that even though they didn't like the, the way it was coded, I mean, the piece of that we do is C plus plus, and it's, it's not that bad, and the performance isn't all that bad either, and so on, it, except for the fact that it, the way it does Emux uses a ton of RAM for no good reason. Um, and maybe that's the reason. Anyway, it doesn't scale to what supervise some of the samples very well. Maybe that's the motivation for VSO to convert. Maybe when they had a personnel change inside or whatever. But anyway, they got some reason for doing the true version. Presumably, the instruments are going to be so converted better. But the sense of the VSO test we do is so converted is pretty convertible right now. Um, the DMUX tolerance on base, and, and on all of them, basically. If you don't say otherwise, I think the tolerance, you know, I, I can't find this document anywhere. This is just a, a guess based on observations of how it behaves. Is that the default is to allow one mismatch tolerance to the sample sheet. So, um, unless your sample sheet contains entries that are two mismatches apart or closer, in which case it will do exact matches only. Uh, that's the rules that it applies uh, in terms of what to do. Um, and like I said, 10 XL range or DMUX is really just a wraparound piece of the test, too. Um, and so you get, you know, some bunch of that two files out of this process. Um, most of you probably aren't even iterating, but you do have the option of sort of inspecting the output of this, 
guessing some kind of change because without sort of the data driven approach, you don't really have a lot of strong signals about what to do. So you know, like, oh, all my all my all my samples failed. Well, maybe you start trying things like flipping the reverse complements or exchanging islands and stuff like that. You could just kind of guess maybe that you know whatever. You kind of got to do some intuition and sort of solving because the full universe of possibilities of what to do is pretty big. You know, what sequences do I put into the sample sheet to fix it? Um, so you know, anyway, so you know, you can iterate this, but you generally don't have very good signals as to what to do, and so you're you're kind of guessing about what changes to make. And you know, base space you only kind of get five tries. Um, You know, we already kind of talked about what some of the indicators are, like uh, debug fails really big, or um, you know, one of your sample piles is small and you don't expect it to be small or something. You might even get somewhere on the base space page might tell you kind of like what the most frequent indices that aren't covered by your sample sheet are that are present in the lane. That can give you a little, uh, you know, like if you've got a simple case where you've got one missing and kind of one extra, that might just be the sequence that is the extra. Um, so there's some cases where it gives you a little bit to, to go on, but in general, you're, you don't really got a lot of indicators for what to do, and you don't really get a lot of hints as to exactly what changes to make to the sample sheet. So this is the approach I take, um, which again, we start with the raw run folder, but we do not start with the sample sheet. We do a first run of VCL with FASTQ2 in non-DMUX mode, basically without a sample sheet. And without a sample sheet, what it's basically going to do is just give us the main reads and the index reads, but not do anything. It's not going to try to break reads into files. We just get one giant file with all the reads. And then using standard Unix utilities like sort and, and stuff, uh, we make a histogram of the index reads. Okay, so we histogram I1, we histogram I2. If we're doing joints, we also histogram the, the concatenation of I1 and I2. And, this, and then we look at, say, the tops of those histograms. Those are very important pieces of data decide what's going on. And using some web tools I'll show you tomorrow and you know some R I'll show you tomorrow. I also use Mathematica a lot and you can use whatever data analysis pipeline you get. And you guys basically got these histograms as inputs and then you need to maybe do some computation with them. So use whatever Python doesn't matter. We use whatever you know, platform you like to do your data science with. And you're going to then use your brain and and sort of figure out empirically what's present in the lane. And at this point, maybe you also take a peek at the sample sheet. I mean, sometimes the lane is a really simple one, really clear what's going on. Just, just look at the top of the histogram, no question what's going on, done. Then you go look at the sample sheet. Sometimes it's so confusing, you kind of like partially figure out what's going on. Then you got to look at the sample sheet, try to match it up, come up with some hypotheses, maybe dig a little more. In, in extreme cases that are very confusing, for example, you may have to go and figure out like what are all the kit boxes being used by all the members of this lane. Then go get the full list of indices that are in all these kits and now look for those specifically and so on if the lane's really noisy uh, to try to figure out what's base call error and what's really present and so on. You know, there's all kinds of uh, things that can go on there. That, so on. But basically, we're using our brain to interpret uh, these uh, histograms and other information we have, like the user sample sheet, to kind of come up with some kind of informed, empirically informed sample sheet that uh, contains alterations to match more closely what happened and then also sometimes some mitigation so we may actually be starting to make creative uses of the sample sheet like maybe we'll add some you know so maybe one of these samples has an expected index which is present to some degree but then it has some tree mismatch corruption which is not captured by the one mismatch too much tolerance but we're very sure it belongs to the sample and is also a high representation and so we would also like to get a pile of it out so we may add another row in the sample sheet for this extra variant. It's sort of a variant version of this guy. We'll get two DMX piles out, but then downstream can combine those piles together and proceed. And that way we kind of recover both uh, empirically sequencing variants of this guy that the one was actually called that cannot recover. So there's all kinds of, so, so alterations are more things like, you know, completely changing, you know, the sequence that, that for a sample that's, that's, that, uh, that was expected or adding or removing samples. The mitigations is more like sort of more creative uses of the sample sheet to uh, recover uh, more out of it than, than you might otherwise get. And then we do a second VCL with FASTQ2 run now in DMUX mode, but using this sample sheet instead of the original sample. Um, so this is this is the uh, general uh, approach here. So the big disadvantage here, of course, is that you need some knowledge, experience, expertise, and time to do this. 
The other one basically is just completely mechanical, which is the great appeal. To, sit, to submit the length for sequencing, you have to submit a sample sheet. Uh, the core can just basically concatenate all the sample sheets that go into the lane and pass that off to the instrument. You actually load that on the instrument when you, when you start the run, and the instrument will upload that to base space. And when the base space run upload finishes, an automatic demux occurs and whatever. It's very convenient. Um, uh, that's the appeal. Uh, but um, like I say, it's not like I'm expecting everybody to do this, this whole thing all the time. But the histogram stage is, is fairly accessible and that is really a good one to look at. So if you could kind of do this stage and maybe a little bit of the web tools or something, that's already gonna be a, a, a win in a lot of cases and so on. Whether you kind of get to this part, this is a harder part. This, this is sort of more like a detection of problems. And then over here, we're now into more like mitigation of problems. This is a more complicated business than uh, this stage. Uh, so this would be the first place to, to start uh, looking into uh, adoption. Um, and, and yeah, okay, so um, we talked a little bit over here about the mixed lanes. This, uh, this approach, this, this uh, data-driven approach is good for those mixed lanes because you can lift up the lanes with shorter index formats up to the longest index format that's common to everybody. Um, this sort of empirical histogram approach is what gives you the, it's how you discover what sequences you need to be including for those, for the missing parts, you know, we, the, the, the kit documentation for the single index guys didn't tell you what the, they would sequence as uh, in I2, but we can just figure it out from the data. Um, uh, here's some examples of mitigations that we can put into that sample. This new sample sheet, I can say, like, I'll improve recovery or something. So, I mean, we'll get some examples tomorrow. Um, yeah, so like if the DMUX tolerance that you're going to be able to run with in BCL to SP2 isn't going to be enough to capture the sort of the cloud of errors around each guy. We'll just add more rows that have sort of new targets for it to, to grab those out. Um, in fact, we can also intentionally move targets off center. So another thing that happens is that you may have a case where sort of like two, two people mix their stuff together uh, from kit A to B. This guy has an index and this guy has an index that have to be two mismatches apart. Well, that's going to force B seal the fast due to be much of exact matches only. If these are below the three mismatch. Uh, rule for being able to be tolerant. That means all samples on this entire flow cell are now subject to exact matches only. Well, that may really hurt the recovery of some of these guys. Maybe this guy has a 30% error variant that's one mismatch away. Well, he just lost 30% of his recovery. So what can we do? Well, we might take one of these two conflictors and intentionally in the sample sheet, push one of them one base away, intentionally target it off center. Now it looks like these two are three mismatches apart. The whole lane can demux with one mismatch tolerance. And the one mismatch tolerance will take the uncorrupted form of the guy we intentionally lied about and still recover him. And so this can be a way kind of like you kind of like uh, get back to a three mismatches world without and only kind of, you know, you understand. Um, uh, yeah, and sometimes the, the corrections are just really wild. So for here was a recent guy. Uh, ZVP 178 lane one, second index. It was expected to have only two distinct sequences there. Uh, I think they were shared by multiple uh, guys, multiple libraries, because uh, index one then further separated them. But these are the two sequences that were expected. But empirically, this first one came out as a mix of these two, and the second one came out as a mix of these two. And that took a little bit to figure out. But look at how different those are. <laughs> So, I mean, that's a, one of these examples that kind of looks like a total failure, but was actually almost totally recoverable in the end. It's just that you would never guess that these are the, how, you know, this changed to this, this changed to this. This is an example of one of these base color went nuts uh, cases. Um, yeah, you, you may just find completely unexpected uh, additional mix components. Uh, there's some other little bits you'll find uh, sprinkled throughout here and so on. Um, so one thing that also makes this approach more difficult is if certain things happen that make the interpretation of the histograms difficult. The number one thing that really complicates things is high representation ratios, meaning that you have library mixed components where some of them have an effective concentration much higher than others. Tens of fold, not that bad. Hundreds of fold, not great. Thousands fold, oh, please. And that happens more than you might think. So what that means is that, for example, in an 
even when things are behaving, you know, the aluminum based color error rates like say of 1%. So now here you've got a high representation library at the top of the lane. It's hundreds of millions of copies of this guy. 1% base color errors of him. Well, here's a guy a hundredfold down in representation from him. 1% errors out of this guy are now the same size as this guy in whole. So if this guy's target index is close to this guy, like maybe this guy and this guy are three mismatches apart. Well, it means this guy is now spilling out things one mismatch apart from him, which will be in, could be in the two mismatches away from this guy's direction at size equal to this guy, right? Well, and now things that have happened at the 0.1% level, one in a thousand level for this guy are still 10% the size of this guy. And you can easily reach these situations where sort of like the clouds around the big guy start bleeding, you know, start becoming very sizable in terms of the smaller guy. This is why representation ratios just make everything worse because the representation ratio scales the relative size of problems. The big guys get to have the representation ratio multiply the rates of their problems when you start looking at what's happening to the little guy. So yeah, little guys in the face of big guys can see all kinds of stuff. And it makes it, if you're trying to go down the histogram by frequency to try to interpret what's going on, you get these situations with high representation ratios around of like, well, am I looking at a real guy here or is this a corruption of a big guy, right? This is a, it's, it's a rare event relative to the big guy, but the big guy is so high that his, his 1% level is still huge uh, relative to other, other libraries that are floating around here. So you can kind of imagine how interpreting the histogram just sort of gets more and more confused as you kind of go ahead down further and further because uh, the rare events of the bigger guys are now being comparable in size to the uncorrupted versions of your other guys. Uh, index hopping, this, you know, when targets are less than three mismatches apart, obviously, again, that just leads to more confusion between things that are error corruptions or are they really uh, uncorrupted other, you know, targets. Um, Obviously, as mixtures get more complicated, high complexity mixtures, you know, 300 sample mixtures, a lot of thing, more things happen, much more complicated to figure out. I mean, you've got, first of all, you've got to find 300 real rows in this, in this histogram that are actually the uncorrupted versions. And there's so many corruptions of these. It's just, uh, it just creates a large amount of uh, mess to look through to try to pick out what's what. Um, yeah, anyway, well, I mean, we'll see examples tomorrow of, of these histograms and so on. So don't do that. So that's. So some people like to do these little spike ins. Some people like to do these little spike ins. Oh, I'll just throw this in a little bit and find out if it's good or not or whatever. It's just asking for trouble. I mean, just that's what the I seeks for and so on. I mean, uh, if if you so. If the, the spike in is really far apart in sequence, in, in index sequence from all the other guys, yeah, maybe. But even so, you can't really suppose he comes out with a very low DMUX pile size. You still can't know whether most of that is him or not. Because you could just have, he could be almost absent, but just some weird stuff of the big guys is just, just randomly hitting that target, right? So the fraction of that very tiny DMUX pile that comes out. The fraction of that pile that's really him, you really don't know. Now, if you do have some way of knowing, like the, the spike ins from another genome or something, and the other guys are from this genome, and this little spike ins from another genome, and most of the spike in pile, DMUX pile, does go to the correct genome, that's better. That's then you know you're okay. But basically, without other ways to interpret whether that DMUX pile of a small guy really is anything to do with a small guy or not, you don't really know because it could just be random stuff from the other guys. So, so, so I'm saying it's like, it's, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, it, it often doesn't lead to con really actionable conclusions on the little guy. Yeah. But uh, you know, maybe we just do one is two right. times more than the other. Well, oh, 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 ratios of one to two and two, one, that's not what we're worried about. Oh, we're okay. worried about like 100 to one, oh, you know, 50 to one, that. things like that's not so bad. You know, one to two is, you can't even make it. Most people cannot make a 50 sample mixture with only a two to one ratio top to bottom. Right. 
most people find that extremely difficult. Once in a while, we'll get like a, a hundred mixture that's like two to one top to bottom, and it's amazing. That the guy likes you, you, you got that dialed in that process. Um, yeah, but no, ten to one is not a problem. We're talking more like hundred to one, and and so on. That's 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 that's, a, that's trouble. That's a spiking. Yeah, that's don't don't do that. Is is the lesson. Um, and I, I showed you the, the thing from the point of view of starting with a raw run folder. Sometimes you're in a situation where the only thing you have is an already DMUX file you do not have access to a raw run folder. As long as your DMUX that you have is an unabridged DMUX that still contains all things in the lane, including the DMUX fail, that's what a complete you know, DMUX output should be, is all that. But maybe somebody just really gave you a slice of the data that you know, they, they didn't give you, you don't have it. But if you have really the complete contents of the lane, just happens to be phrased in the form of DMUX FASB files, you can still do this whole process and come out with a read and optimized QC controlled, uh, optimized read DMUX of that stuff. Um, all right. When you, uh, these are the basically some of the indicators that you can do even in the blind approach. But here's what these indicators look like once you do the optimized approach. So here in the, like the upper left corner in yellow for 208 uh, lanes that I did is the DMUX fail rate expressed as a percentage of PF1s. So, you know, PF, most of the statistics you want to look at relative to the amount of reads you got, right? You don't want to, the amount of the flow cell that was populated in the wells is related to like loading concentrations and stuff. And that's low, that's bad or whatever, but you don't want to consider you, you know, those wells didn't even have a chance, right? If they didn't even get filled with data. So you, most of the statistics you phrase relative to the number of PF1 wells, the number of reads you actually got out as opposed to the capacity of the flow cell. So this bottom right one is the, the PF1 rate, which you don't you know have as much control over. DMUX doesn't have anything to do with this bottom right one. This is more like concentrations and stuff. Of course, if your PF1 rate is really low, that's something you want to figure out, but it's not really a DMUX problem. It's like you're, your, your library constructs don't like the sequence on the instrument or the concentration's wrong or something. Uh, the, the, you know, the insert lengths are weird or something. So, you know, I mean, it, mostly you want to be around here, 80, 80, 90%, uh, and so on is, is where you kind of want to aim for. Um, but this has not, not really, this is not really a DMUX question here. So but basically this is the denominator now for, for these other guys. Uh, so DMUX fail rate expresses a percent of PF1, meaning how big is the DMUX fail pile? The, the undetermined file relative to the number of reads that we got out of the lane. And when I'm done with my procedure, it's pretty much 2% and lower is, is typical. And maybe 4% is the upper end of typical. So if you're, if you're with a blind approach, you know, above 4%, that's, that's probably, that's, that's already a flag. It's like, this is a weird lane. I mean, from my point of view, I can probably explain more than that. Um, and, and for me, it's 2% is a more typical unexplained rate. Um, uh, productivity rate, this is um, the PF1s minus the phi x and minus the index hopping that you're able to detect from duals. I mean, if you're running single indices, you can't really directly detect some nest hops. But in other words, this is sort of the fraction of the lane that went into usable user DMUX piles. So, you know, 95% and up typical. So if you're lower than that, you know, if you're down here or something, this is another place where probably uh, my approach would help you out. Um, this is percent phi x as determined by the index uh, read. So, so phi x uh, in terms of how it sequences on the Nova seek, here are the indices. The first index actually sequences the poly D, it doesn't prime. Because uh, phi x comes from, phi x comes from before, phi x version three, which is I think the reagent they actually buy, which is the only reagent that really sells comes from essentially the pre, even the pre-indexing uh, world. It was never designed with a uh, true six file indices in it. And so the current uh, I1 primer doesn't even prime it. And so you basically get dark, which is poly G on the current return. So the first index sequences is poly G. And the second e sequence currently sequences as this, because we currently use version 1.5 plus reagents, chemistry reagents on the Nova seed. Uh, pre 1.5 reagents, it actually came out of a different sequence uh, on I2. But these are these are the targets you would add to the sample sheet uh, for uh, flags, and I, I essentially recommend you always add flags as a target because 
maybe the core edited it, maybe they did. I mean, what's the, I mean, if you add it in and it doesn't produce anything in the output file, so what? But, you know, you might as well add it as a target because there's sort of this chance that it's there. Um, uh, yeah, anyway, so we, we, okay, so we went through those. Um, yeah, so like I said, these are pretty much your only indicators, uh, except for the size of the individual sample DMUX files that you get in the blind approach. It kind of acts like a car's check engine light, right? Now, so if this light is on, you know there's something wrong, but you kind of know what to do. And it's not like it catches every mechanical problem in the car either, right? So it's kind of like this is what you got in, in the uh, blind approach. But there I gave you some sort of you know, tips, like, you know, DMUX fail over 4%, you know, that's that's not good. Uh, you know, less than ninety five percent is coming out of reusable piles is not good. Um, and what you'll get with my approach is, you know, once you start looking at the histogram and R and stuff like this, you'll get a lot more detailed and interpretable indicators about what's going on. Um, all right, so let let me do a little review now, but I'm going to do this with sort of this visual aid that I think is a very good mental picture to have, sort of understand kind of what DMUX is really. Uh, doing and kind of makes it kind of obvious that all these problems can occur and how you might detect them and so on. So imagine the index reads as being some kind of actual space, like some geometric space. So um, this is a space, it's, it's a, you know, it's a discrete space of, of strings, you know, it's these ACGT n strings, which K here might be, you know, seven if you're doing uh, an old style uh, tree seed a single index lane, maybe you're doing eight to eight duals, and k might be 16. You've got 16 index bases. So k is how many index bases you've got. And each sequence is a point in this space. Each possible distinct index sequence is a point in this space. And so I'm trying to draw it in three dimensions here. So some points are closer to you than others. So the blue ones are closer to you, the red ones further back in the screen somewhere. Okay. And then Nearby sequences in the space correspond to the way the sequencer behaves in terms of uh, sequencing error. So when the machine's behaving, you know that means that sort of like things with small numbers of mismatches, those are close together in the space. Or maybe things with a single indel, they're a little further away than one mismatch, but they're somehow closer there than completely random machines related to. So like this, this, this points that we had here, maybe these are little variants that are kind of close by, right? So here's, here's a single base mismatch. He's close by. This is an indel. We lost the C here. Uh, uh, and so this is a little further away. And then here's a one mismatch guy. So these two are close, okay? Now in general, in the full generality, distance is very complicated in the space because when the base color goes nuts, it's a very complicated thing. It doesn't make much sense, but I mostly want you to think of the kind of the normal case, which is where, you know, small numbers of mismatches, as mismatches increase, you're kind of getting further away. Indels get further away a little faster. Um, now your targets, your DMUX targets, are going to be specific points in the space, right? And it's the specific sequences that you're expecting to see for each target. Those are just single points. And some of your targets will be closer pairwise than others. Uh, we talked about how the commercial prep kits aren't all well designed. We'll, we'll talk about more of that with examples on day three. So then, when you actually get a real sequencing lane, which has you know hundreds of millions of, of indexes, then we can make like a density plot, right? We can do a density plot in the space, like make little histogram bins and then color things darkly depending on how many uh, observations we see there. Things with a huge number of observations really dark. Uh, things that we don't really observe at all, points in the space we don't observe, but it should be clear, right? So then we're kind of expecting the output of the experiment to look something like this, right? So there should be little clouds around each of the targets. Uh, uh, the center of their cloud should be most dense because that's the expected sequence, and then base call errors will cause it to fuzz out a little bit. One mismatch is the most common, and then two mismatches are the less common, so the ball should kind of get, you know, fuzz out as you kind of uh, get further away from the center. Um, and then DMUX is going to have some kind of tolerance, which are these little white circles. It says that things that are close enough to the center are going to be, those are what's going to go into the DMUX pile. And things that are beyond the white circle, we're just going to give up on. Okay, that's the DMUX tolerance. Like we talked about how the default for Lumen tools is like one mismatch. So the colors correspond to the true originating biomaterial. That's what we really want to know. 
but it's not what we observe, right? We don't get to observe it, that's hidden data. In fact, the data as it comes to us is gray, right? All we get is the density. The, what DMUX actually is, is the problem of trying to put the colors back. So I have a point in this space, what color should I, should I give it? Um, in fact, DMUX also is really kind of the problem figuring out even what the set of colors is, right? So it's like figure out what the set of color is and then label points in the space by what color uh, we're pretty sure they came from. And some points we'll just have to give up on and leave as gray and they'll be in the DMUX fail pile. So what happens if the DMUX tolerance is really small, like exact matches only? Well, in general, what that's going to do is we're going to get low recovery and DMUX fail will be high because we're not going to capture enough of the fuzz balls. Yeah, the centers of them we got, but then there's a lot of the cloud that we could have gotten because it's kind of still clear which one is being quit, but they're not in our tolerance and we're losing. If the DMX tolerance is too large, we'll even have this, the, the, the tolerance balls overlap. And the way the Illumina tools are written is that they will refuse to run as soon as there's overlap doesn't matter whether there's data in the overlap or not. Just as soon as the balls overlap at all, they will not run. So this is what causes uh, the thing to automatically drop down to exact matches only as soon as you got two guys that are less than three mismatches apart. Because if, I, if, if the closest distance two targets gets is three mismatches apart, and I allow one mismatch tolerance, you can imagine that's like here, and this is here. How close can these two fuzz balls get? They're still forced to be separated by a mismatch. Because the closest, if somebody is in the overlap, he's one mismatch to this guy and one mismatch to this guy. And that means the two centers have to be at most two mismatches apart. And since the minimum distance between the two guys is three, that's not possible. So the balls do not overlap. The little white circles do not overlap. So that's, that's the limited situation. And so uh, when we get to R and we'll do our little version of DMX, we won't actually have that limitation. Uh, our general rule for DMUX will be something like, if you have any point in the space, go and look at its distance to all of the targets, find out what the smallest distance is. If there's a unique guy at the smallest distance, well, there you go. And if there's multiple guys at the smallest distance, we're not sure which one it goes. Then you get to decide, well, so like if there's conflicts, it's DMUX fail, and then you might as well probably also you're gonna have a tolerance on the mismatch distance. So even if there's a unique guy seven mismatches away, well, seven is too big. So our rule will be something like, you know, how many guys are at the minimum distance away? How many targets are at the minimum distance away from you? If that's more than one, you're gone. And if, the, and if that distance is also too big, you're gone. But if there's a unique guy close to you, that's where you go. And we won't care if the balls overlap. We do it more on a per data, per by per data point basis. Um, but the limited tools will just refuse to run if there's overlap of the, of the uh, tolerance balls. All right, well, suppose the tolerance balls don't overlap, but they're still pretty big. What's going to happen? Well, you're going to get some misty ones, right? Because here you've got the red balls and the green balls. The red and green are close enough that their fuzz balls overlap. And so if the tolerance balls don't overlap so that we're actually running DMUX and producing output, then that part of red that leads into green is going to go in the green pile. And so the green pile will be contaminated with red. Um, and so that's misty ones. We don't like that. So here's the problem. One of the reasons why we don't like high representation guys is suppose red has 100x representation of green. Well, his ball is going to get bigger because he's just got more chances for all kinds of things to happen. And so if green is very small and red is a very big ball and red and green are fairly close, it could be that the thing that we, the, the amount in the green pile that's actually green could be small. Right, because there's so much red bleeding in there, and green is a low representation guy. That actually, the fraction of the green pile that is green may be low. And that that's bad, right? That's that means uh, that's just bad. <laughs> that's what we want to avoid. And that's that's basically, yeah. Large representation ratios make everything worse because yeah, they scale as everything scales as sort of the size of the small guy, not the size of the big guy. And for the same reason, when you measure DMX performance and stuff, it really doesn't matter what the lane average is or what the big guys are doing. It matters what the problem sizes are relative to the small guys in the lane. At least if you care about the small guys, because the small guys are the ones where those absolute numbers are gonna possibly overwhelm themselves. Um, 
So here's like you know a more extreme thought experiment version. You know, suppose there's no errors whatsoever. You've got 500 million A and 500,000 B, and then you've introduced one percent Bmux error. Right, so now you take one percent of this guy and you move him here, and one percent of this guy and you move him here. So that moves, you know, five million of him from A to B, and it moves five thousand of B into A. Well, now what fraction of each output pile is true? Well, in the A pile, it's still ninety nine point nine 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 percent because you move so little into it, and it's no big deal. But you just put five million of A into a tiny B, and so B is now only nine percent true. So this is, you know, and you know, these are extreme, you know, this is a thousand to one, but you know, I mean, this happens at a different degree as the, as the ratios go. This is, you know, represent terrain ratios, not good, not good. Um, and continuing that kind of thought, interpretation of DMX piles that end up being small is always fraught with difficulty because, you know, like I say, that red guy is small. So that means even little bits of spill from other guys end up contaminating the pile highly. So, you know, okay. So we'll, we'll uh, I think I, I, these slides are out of order. I should probably swap these two slides. All right, so let's, I'll jump back. So, okay, so then suppose we have this situation. We're sort of like, you think that there's a center here. Like this is one of the targets you think is there, but it's actually missing empirically. You may still get a non-zero, Demux pile for it because it's getting bleed from somebody else. Now you think he's actually present. No, he's not. That's just bleed from somebody nearby. Maybe there's an extra over here. And this really, you know, this is E3 in the box and this is E4 or something, you know, whatever. So it's actually really this guy's center is over here. But yeah, you know, just, just because he's there at low concentration does not mean he's there. Right. Um, you know, anyway, so. Yeah, be very, very careful with how you interpret small size piles. Uh, what you think is the center might not be, right? We talked about how like you can have these systematic errors that sort of even outcompete the uncorrupted version. So you may have an off center. Well here, okay, at least it's gonna be, looks like it's all red, but you're not gonna get most of the red, right? So here you've got a very poor recovery of red. Instead, what you need to do is realize that empirically the center is over here and, and move your target from here to here and get a better recovery of red. Um, another bad sign, which you're not going to really see at all unless you use like the R and stuff that we'll do tomorrow, is that it's a bad sign is sort of like the ball, your, your tolerance ball is being hit from what I call the outside in, okay? You're really expecting the highest concentration of reads that make it into a pile to be the target sequence. And then as you move in mismatches away from there, the, the amount you get should be less and less. If instead, all of your hits into a pile are high mismatch. And so like the, the number of high mismatch is the highest. And then as you move towards what you think is the center, actually you're not getting much data at all or, or no data at all. So that your, your, your ball, you, this, this is the collection ball. Everything in this gray circle is what's going into your DMUX pile. But it's sort of being hit outward from the outside in. That's a bad sign that says that this is probably not the right ball, right? So this, this is not a target. Um, this is really just getting bleed from somebody else. Um, that's one way to tell. And then there's index hopping, which is basically dead center. It doesn't mean anything. You can still have this, this, this wrong sample, perfectly good indices. It's not a sequencing problem. It's, a, it's an attachment of molecules and adapters problem. Um, okay. So, yeah. So, like, in fact, mux debugs can actually be the overall limit for sample purity. So a lot of times you think, you know, you're doing chips, you know, chip seek or something, you may think that like, uh, you know, your, your extraction efficiency or, or you know, your separation efficiency or something is all wet bench limited. Well, sometimes it's actually mux and demux is really what's limiting the purity of your samples. The, the cross sample contamination's major factor can be the mux demux. Um, sometimes you can rejigger it so that you can get rid of it. And sometimes you can't, uh, but at least, you know, with the sort of the bottom up approach, you are going to kind of be able to figure out kind of maybe which one it is. And in the case of where you can't fix it, you will fix it. Um, yeah, anyway, so, so the problem is, is that the, the blind black black approach 
it's just not dynamic at all, right? So it just doesn't, it's not gonna see all these problems. This is not gonna realize it's happening, not gonna move the little white circles around or adapt at all or whatever. That's what we're hoping to gain with the, with the data-driven approach. Okay, so also with uh, that, we actually have our first kind of entries in that slide I keep talking about at the end of day three, which is the summary of things to do and don't. We already can start our list of things to do and you know, to do and, and, and so on to avoid trouble. And number one would be keep your targets far apart, right? You know, so you want all of your pairwise targets in the final mix to have sequences that are far apart, right? You know, how far apart, uh, we'll talk about next slide. Um, and in general, that means a priority coordination with complex mixtures. Tomorrow, we'll talk about a web tool that'll help with that. Uh, if you're doing dual indexing, because the way index hopping works, that means the apartness should be done independently on the first and second indices not concatenate the two indices and treat those as some, you know, if you're doing eight plus eight dual, it's not like those 16 MERS are the things you have to keep apart. No, you have to keep the individual eight MER I1s and individual eight MER I2s far apart. Because index hopping is what scrambles those around. And effectively, what the targets are in terms of the analysis are is every possible combination of all unique I1s and all unique I2s. And that means that the distance you see is effectively the minimum of the pairwise distance of I1 alone and I2 alone. So those two distances independently must be kept apart. Um, okay, sure. Keep your representation ratios under control, right? No intentional large ratios. Try to do a decent job in prep, in prep and construction and pooling to you know, quantify and mix to avoid unintentional large ratios. Um, avoid spike-ins. Uh, Delux time can't be too large or too small. Right now, we don't have a lot of guidance on how to choose that. That'll be tomorrow. Um, and be very wary about interpretation and downstream use of small size piles. Um, in terms of how much to keep uh, targets apart, the strong, strongly recommend your minimum is to stay at least three mismatches apart. And that's a lot driven by the Illumina tools, but it's also driven by the common case. So the Illumina tools, that we, as we've been talking about, they actually only support zero, one, and two mismatch. And the minimum target target distance that they require to even start demuxing the lane to achieve those tolerances is uh, for zero mismatch, you can keep the targets just distinct. That's it. But for one mismatch tolerance, it needs at least three mismatches away from the, from the targets. And if, and if you want to do two mismatch errors, it requires at least five uh, apart on the targets. And the common case when the index based calls are actually behaving and have similar qualities to what typical main reads look like. Usually that single mismatch demuch tolerance is usually both sufficient for decent recovery. And it's often needed because exacts only recovery, which is the next level down, usually throws away too much. And so one mismatch is sort of exactly where you want to be in the common case. And one mismatch tolerance in the little tools requires three mismatch target targets. So basically that's the point. That's where the recommendation comes from, but very much try to keep your, your intentional mixing to the point where all mixed components are at least three mismatches apart. Um, uh, okay, so, all right, we got 10 minutes and we started a little late. I mean, you guys okay with like going in 10 minutes after 12 or you guys wanna start stop right at 12 or? You have gotta go, okay, you're good. Okay, well, two, Three out of four gone. So we're going to stop at 12. Um, do you need to go now or 10 minutes ahead? Or? At 12. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. We, we, this is now where we're actually going to start hands on like examples and stuff. So run BCL to FASQ2, look at the histograms and so on. And we're, we don't have much time today. So we're just going to barely get started. And then we're going to really get into that in examples on day two. Um, so this is real data. I'm going to show you ZBP 098 lane one. And I got permission from the submitter for this lane to actually distribute the data for this lane. But to protect their stuff a little bit, the way we do that is that I deleted almost all of the main ends. All we care about in this is the indices. So you have the data for the indices, but not you only have like one base for main end one and one base for main end two. That's OK. It's enough to do everything you need to do. Nothing in this workshop we do cares about the main ends, basically. So just the index reads are, are enough. And I threw, I kept one base of main ends in there so that the BCL to FASQ2 run will look exactly as if it was a full run. 
anyway, this saves us disk space, it saves us time, it protects the submitter's data. The other thing I did is I got rid of the sample sheet that the, the submitter. You don't need to know the identity of any of the samples that are involved um, and so on. It just, you know, we just care about uh, figuring out kind of what indices are present and whether, uh, you know, and so on. So, so this was a, a paired in 5151 main read guy with eight uh, nucleotide single index. So it's a 518051, if you like. Um, and the submitter expects a 20 plex of, uh, inside this thing. And um, we on Hoffman 2, let's see here if I can get out of it. I, yeah, okay. So oh, let me get a, let's see if we can make this bigger. All right, so. Okay, now normally we should not do anything on a login node, but on a compute node, but we're just gonna poke around the file system right now. So I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna stay on that login node. So here inside uh, you scratch seek hocus, my scratch directory, there's this directory. And this has the data uh, uh, relative here. So this directory contains uh, the raw run folder, but thin down to get rid of the data that I told you we deleted the main end. You know, there's only one cycle left of each main end. So let's look inside there. This is, the, this is the kind of data, data you would get from the core if you asked for a raw run folder, or if you went to base space and downloaded the raw uh, run folder. So raw run folders get names like this. This is the year, month, and day of the start date. So this is April 7, 2021 was the start date of this run on the instrument. This is the instrument serial number. This is the instrument scan number. This is the flow cell serial number. These are also what you will see in the fields inside the FASQ files that come out, like we saw earlier today. Inside the raw run folder at the top level, you'll see a bunch of metadata files like this XML file and this XML file, a bunch of others, um, some directories here. Um, let's look at these metadata files here like run info to XML. And here you will see things like interesting information like the read configuration. So here's the physical read configuration. There were three reads, 51, 8, 51. The middle one is an index read. So that tells you that this was a 51, 8, 0, 51. Uh, paired end single index, eight more single index, 5151 for the main reads. Um, there's some other metadata in here, but mostly what we care about from our point of view is, is, uh, is that. Um, the run parameters has similar information, like here is the run configuration there. So read one, 51, read two, 51, that's the main reads, index read one, eight, index read two, zero. Um, and there's a bunch of stuff in here. Uh, most of these files you don't care about. Um, I'll just give you a little peek. So in the data directory, in the intensities directory, there's this s.locks file. That's a binary file that describes the honeycomb layout of, this, of, the, of the flow cell. So this is a description of the uh, honeycomb layout of individual wells in each tile of this thing. It's a shared by all tiles, which is why it's here instead of deeper down. Um, then in the base calls directory, there's the directory for each lane. Uh, so here there's lane one. And here you'll see these filter files. Those are uh, binary files that communicate the PF1 and zero status of each of the nano wells. Uh, the logs file has to describe the entire uh, layout of flow cell. And then the filter files is telling us which subset of that stuff is basically live in each tile. Uh, so this is essentially the PF1 files. Then there are subdirectories here, one for each cycle. Now I deleted cycles two to 51 here because that's the 50, tail 50 basis of main end one, but 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59 are the eight index cycles. The cycles are just numbered one all the way down uh, as you go, no gap between any of the stages. Uh, cycle 60 here is the first base of main end two, and I deleted cycle 61 to whatever, 109. Nine, you gotta do the math, right? We gotta do it right. 51, eight, 51 is 110. So cycle 61 to 110, you can believe. So if you look inside one of these per cycle directories, this is the path that we're in now. It's getting pretty long data intensities, base calls, lane one, C52, cycle 52. And then there's a single file here that's uh, for the second surface, the bottom surface. This is an SP flow cell. Um, so it's actually only got a single surface, which happens to be numbered surface two. So the tile numbering actually goes 2101 to 21 something. 
or 22 something or whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. Anyway, so this, this one, uh, one file contains all the information for bottom surf for image sur the, the single image surface of the SP flow cell for cycle 52 of lane one of this flow cell. And BCL to FASTQ2, for example, knows how to interpret this thing. But inside this file is essentially the ACGTNs and Q scores for this particular chunk of the data. Um, the binary formats for all these files is known. You don't care. I, I know I could tell you if you really want to know, but the, there's no, basically every byte in these raw run folders is, is known how to interpret. Um, most of these other files you just don't care about at all, like these log files and so on, don't matter at all for the DMUX and, and, and BCL uh, conversion. I've shown you basically all the files that are essential for the BCL to FASTQ2 to work. Um, okay, we're down to, to two minutes here. Yeah, like I said, raw rub folders can be big, over a terabyte for four lane S4s. Um, BCL to FASTQ2 has uh, changed versions a couple of times. It's been pretty stable for a long time because uh, nothing's changed for quite a while with the Nova Seek, but you know, I, I expect with the Nova X to get some changes. But BCL to FASTQ2 is pre, uh, the current version 2.20 is pre-installed on Hoffman 2 in the module system. So you, if you've done Hoffman 2, you may know that it has this module system where some software is installed. But they, you know, they have they can have parallel versions and stuff like that. That's not they're all like automatically active all the time. You have to sort of tell it which one you want. Uh, it's a little hard to see that list, but we could uh, kind of search for BCL in that list, and you'll see here that there is BCL to FASTQ2 version two twenty zero four twenty two, and so if we can do module load that, and then the program is called BCL to FASTQ without the two because I guess the two is. There's a BCL to FASTQ2 one, but somehow everyone calls it BCL to FASTQ2 for version two. But I guess they, the command line's name assumes that the two is part of the version number. So it doesn't actually have the two here, whatever. Anyway, this is what the command is called. Um, if you do double dash help, you will get uh, the list of command line options uh, there that uh, you, can, you can look at that uh, on your own. And so, okay, so we're, we're just about a time now, but basically the first step on tomorrow, day, day two, will be to SSH and a Hoffman uh, get a compute node with sufficient resources, and then compose the command line to run this thing and produce the non-DMUX version of this guy, which then we will make the histograms of the index reads on, and then we will go to R, and we will analyze the histogram and figure out what happened and use the web tool I'm I, I got to uh, interpret that histogram as well. Then we will compose a sample sheet, the informed sample sheet there. Then we will run BCL to FASTQ2 again with the, with the sample sheet we compose. And then that then we'll have our DMUX output. And then I think we'll do another example for a paraden run. And then uh, hopefully if we have time, so the, both of the first two runs I'll show you won't have really many problems with them, no, no serious problems. Uh, and then maybe the third example uh, that we'll do uh, tomorrow will have more problems. Um, and so that's the plan for day two. Okay, so I'm gonna stop the recording.